We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. It was crazy movie announcement week this week. With, you know, Spider-Man leaving the MCU, apparently, and then possibly being back in as, like, two places reported, but nothing officially said. And then there's a new Matrix movie because everyone's like, oh, wait, Keanu Reeves is super hot right now. I'm sure he'll still be super hot in three years when the next Matrix movie is ready. <laughs> so they're making another one. But uh, yeah, they, Carrie Ann Moss hasn't made a movie in a long time. But she was in uh, Jessica Jones, at least. So, oh, you're right, and she still looks pretty good. Yeah. So I mean, I, and I don't mean that as some sort of sexist way. I'm just talking about like she still looks young <laughs> enough to be in a Matrix movie. <laughs> yeah, she she hasn't gotten all wrinkly or whatever. But, <laughs> as a you know. continued love interest for Keanu Reeves, who does not age very much at all. That guy, he dies. That's... He dies in the movie, doesn't he? In the last movie, the doesn't Matrix he movie? get sacrificed? Yeah. It's the Matrix, whatever. You, They're just going to MCU them both. Here's my prediction. It's going to get to the point where it's going to be like, uh, Sean Connery's going to go back to playing James Bond, and they're just going to MCU his face <laughs> so he looks young again. Wow. You never know. He could be better. No, here's my prediction for how they're going to do the Matrix. Uh, when they start the fourth Matrix movie, they're just going to be like, when everybody died, in the or Keanu died in the third one, he wakes up again because like everything computer-wise, you would think it would be redundant. There would be redundant systems. So I think what um, he woke up into in the second one was just like a redundant system. He's still inside a computer program. He didn't, you know, that, that's my prediction. That's what I thought the third one was going to be, to be honest. <laughs> what's the, the There's a new, what is it? There's the, it's a remake. No, it's not a remake. There's an, there's another movie that has, that they're having a sequel to that's brand, that's coming out pretty, this year, I think. I saw, I watched like a, a, a video of trailers well, there's like another bill and ted coming dis- out. not that no there was something else On that the keanu i was like they what's that no it wasn't keanu <laughs> uh oh my god i remember seeing it thinking this is the same movie they haven't changed it, <laughs> it looks oh. like exactly the same movie as the first one from the trailer so i'll i'll, I'll remember it as we go through but <laughs> yeah so i finally saw endgame okay uh sat through that three hour slog <laughs> It's. I mean, you were right. Okay, so it's like a love letter to all the characters, mm-hmm. you know, the the original MCU characters and all that. It was definitely. Uh, it had a lot going on there, uh, as far as the first two hours of it, <laughs> uh, and yeah, you know, there was the Russo brothers did a really good job. Yes, you know, as far as I'm concerned, with both those movies, yeah. so those guys can write their own tickets at this mm-hmm. point. No kidding, uh, they've done yeah. it at least three times now. So yeah, so they they've done a very good job. So I'm I. It was a good movie. It's not in to me. It's not Infinity War good, but you know, I think for people who care more about plot and less about things <laughs> blowing up, they're also you know. they really are two parts of one story. So yeah, they are. They are for sure. But you know what? As far as things that have been broken in half mm-hmm. or in th- thirds go, they did a pretty good job. Yeah. You know, they really they really broke it in half in a good way. Like. Uh, Kill Bill Volume One and Two, like Volume One ended, and you're like, "Oh my god, that was great!" And Volume Two started, you're like, "Okay, so when's the rest of this movie gonna start?" Because <laughs> it just, it was like the first hour of it was like, "Okay, we gotta fill this out somehow before we get to the action at the end." But yeah, so saw it. Good on good on movie. Disc, streamed. How yes, was it viewed? I uh, uh, yes, okay, because my kids are terrible people. Mm. Um, I watched it on Blu-ray, yeah. even though I have the 4K disc. Oh. But you don't have a 4K display. I don't, but I have Atmos right. and everything. So I think the Blu-ray is still in Atmos, so I will not uh, I don't know on that disown release. any of them. I think it is. I thought it was. Was the 4K disc was... destroyed or something? Is this is what you're implying? No, they just didn't put it oh, in. I see. Okay. They, I let them insert the disc, and they just put in the Blu-ray disc, and I found out after I took it out, and I was like, you monsters i have to watch this thing again <laughs> so well your dynamic range picture wise was probably actually correct that way anyway because sometimes yeah. bringing the hdr picture down into standard dynamic range for display doesn't always work perfectly so yeah yeah but it was good it was good flick it's definitely worth seeing um 
Yeah. So, all right, let's get on with this. Uh, This AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask us by emailing us a question at avrant.com. You can go to www.avrant.com when it's up. I think it's down right now. Uh, it's I the end of the check. month, so know. it's probably done. Yeah. It is the end of the uh, month. I'm not even going to bother yeah. trying to check. I'll leave it alone. Uh, you can leave a comment there. Just email us a question. At question at avrant.com, please. Yes, please. Or facebook.com slash podcast. Those are the two places that you should hit us up. Everything else is kind of... Don't worry about it. You're going to hear thunder. We have a storm rolling in here. I, it's been growling out there for the last mm. hour. So it's going to come. And I'm sorry about that. As uh, of August 27th at uh, 7 in the morning Pacific time, 10 in the morning Eastern time, avrant.com is still up and functional. We'll see woo-hoo! how long that lasts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you want to see our videos, our avrant, I mean, youtube.com slash avrant. All right. Uh, contact Rob directly. Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. I want to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, I do support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to patreon.com slash avrant podcast where you can sign up for a monthly subscription. It's like, uh, you know, just monthly donations to our podcast you don't have to think about that's right you that's set great. it up once and they just keep taking money from you until you say stop yeah <laughs> so we want to thank our 85 patrons over at patreon yes we do that's patreon.com slash evran podcast if you'd like to sign up thanks very much to our 85 patrons over there and if you're thinking i don't want to do an automatic monthly donation and donate every single month i just want to donate one time uh you can do that via paypal if you come to our website evran.com over on the right-hand side, it says support AV Rant. There's a picture of a cup of coffee, and it will take you to PayPal. Haven't I had any it, PayPal donations in a while. No, we haven't. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because everybody's trying to donate at the end of the month when they get paid. Mm, that could be. <laughs> the website's down constantly. <laughs> Save the link. The link will still work. It doesn't go to an <laughs> AV Rant site. It goes to a PayPal site. All right. Um, if you can't support us financially, figure out some other way to support us and let us know what you did so we can mention you. Tom, uh, who we talked about last week, he let Elite Home Theater Seating and Accessories for Less know that his purchases were thanks to us. He also wanted to share a bit more about uh, info regarding the movie posters he has mounted onto his absorption panels. This was the large, very beautiful theater that we were talking about. Mm-hmm. He, it looked like he had fabric banners over his uh, over his absorption panels on his side walls. That's what it looked like. Anyways, uh, he says he built the absorption panels with the help of a friend, and the posters were hand-painted on flower sacks in Guyana. Does that mean he lives in Guyana? <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think so. Super, super specific. I mean, how do you get... Anyways, so there are projectionists who move from town to town there, and they have a tradition of using these painted posters to promote their upcoming shows. They are just hung with nails or stapled to his acoustic panels. So burlap is completely acoustically transparent mm-hmm. so that's great these things i i didn't even really look at the posters but they're like all these random land of doom <laughs> was it snake man is that what that one says it looks like it says snake man yeah that does first say snake man bullet first bullet is that the back no, one that, in the room? that does say first blood so i'm not sure if they actually were showing the real first blood oh it could I'm be not sure it's somebody, so somebody's squad I can't, I can't quite make out. Is that what that squad. says? Somebody's squad is over there. That could be and Suicide Rambo, Squad. Rambo, First Blood again, uh, the Throne of Fire. And I think that's Beastmaster over there in the back corner. <laughs> that is definitely Beastmaster. Oh, I didn't see the second picture down here. Yes, that's right. Okay, yes. So anyways, uh, I, I'm guessing he got these from like eBay or something like that, which is... Um, gonna steal that idea <laughs> I mean, these are awesome these are super awesome and because while they have the names of uh copyrighted works on them they are original works of art mm-hmm. therefore they are not copyrighted in any way so there's nothing wrong with you buying them so fantastic idea yep. how have i never heard of this i don't know and I, I love the idea of having images that you can change up if and when you want to you don't have to actually yeah. replace the entire panel or rewrap an entire panel you're just you know sticking a an additional piece of fabric that has a lovely printed image on it on top of your existing panel that stays up the whole time and just use it as a nice lovely backdrop that looks like a frame so i think that's a fantastic idea we are stealing Sweet. it love it so- that's so awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, you need to add that to your uh, how to make absorption panels mm. thing. Well, I didn't write that. That, that was you, a Rob W. No, that was other Rob. <laughs> we should addendum that thing. Sure. Let's see if we can figure That's out where he got those idea. things from. All right. 
In the news, Kef has expanded their Q series lineup with the addition of the new Q250C center model. It's a smaller than the existing existing 650C model using five and a quarter inch drivers instead of six and a half. And notably, it's a sealed cabinet design, so it's a bit more flexible in terms of placement options and can also be used either vertically or horizontally for LCR duties. Price is 600 bucks each with black, white, and walnut finish options and grills cost extra. Really? That's what Kef is doing with that Q series these days. I'm not sure why, but they do not come with grills in the box. They're like twenty bucks a piece extra. It's just that's just stupid. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I okay because we're gonna we're having uh, a renovation done on our. We, when we moved to this house, this whole house was renovated and perfect and lovely, mm -hmm. except the home theater would needed to be fixed up because I didn't like the shape of it because uh, it was L instead of. A very small L instead of a very small rectangle. Mm -hmm. And one bathroom was like original from like the 50s. And it's just disgusting. So it's the guest bathroom. It's the one that everybody uses. So my wife has been harping on that for years. We sold our house up in Jacksonville. And part, part of that yeah, congrats. is... Uh, Thank you. Part of that is money is going into that. Mm -hmm. So we're doing this renovation. So yesterday I was shopping for toilets. And you want to make somebody angry? Sell them a toilet without a seat. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That happens real. all the time, yeah. <laughs> but that's how they come. Yep. Most, many of them come without a seat, and or with the this is the same sort of deal. Thinnest plastic seat you've ever seen that right. you would never want to use. Right, <laughs> and I'm like, just you know, don't do that. Instead, and <laughs> sell with, you know, put an extra twenty dollars or forty dollars onto the price and put a decent seat on there. It's the same thing here. It's stupid not to sell, sell them with grills, but. Kef, you do you. Aside from the oodles of content announced by Disney in their D23 event, some of which I watched. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, the video I watched like skipped around a whole bunch, but uh, I'm very... When's, it's November it's being launched November officially? November 12th is, right? is when the Disney Plus streaming service is coming out, and a lot of the shows that they announced at D23 aren't premiering until 2021, so they are <laughs> a good year and I'll a half away. I'll least. see you in 2021, mm -hmm. sir. <laughs> That's like, it's uh, not like you're going to take the new stuff off, right? <laughs> well, even like, uh, I, th I think they even said that, um, uh, what's his name, Falcon and Winter Soldier isn't premiering until 2021 now for some weird reason. So I don't know. Things are off yeah. in the future. But yeah, they announced what uh, Moon Knight, She-Hulk, and Ms. Marvel are three more MCU shows coming to Disney+. Plus. Uh, there's a couple of Star Wars uh, live action Mandalorian and well, the Mandalorian I saw yeah with uh, Pablo Hidalgo, uh, Hidalgo reprising his role from uh, Rogue One that's going to be another separate one and then they're bringing the Clone Wars back for another season animated season so I, I hated the oodles Clone Wars. and oodles of stuff was announced so you can check out I went to the movies stuff. I don't think you guys probably remember that on this podcast I went to the movies to see that first episode of Clone Wars oh. back in the day with my kids with my kid all right, uh, they confirmed that Disney Plus will include up to four simultaneous streams in 4K resolution with Dolby Vision HDR and Atmos audio available, all at the regular $6.99 a month price. Individual profiles, up to seven, can be created with one subscription, and content can be downloaded on mobile devices. It's true of Netflix as well. It is, but to uh, get 4K and HDR and Atmos, you have to pay for the topmost tier, and Disney Plus is like... That's true. Uh, at least at the... I mean, obviously, the price of Disney Plus is going to go up Probably yes. pretty quick, but in yeah. order to onboard everyone in the world, they're like, here's our one low price, lower than just about anybody else's streaming service. It is, yeah. Uh, it is. And right away, no tears. You just get all the stuff that anybody else is offering, the highest quality available for simultaneous streams. So it's all there. They're basically trying to remove any reason you might say to not sign up for Disney+. Plus. Oh, boy. They're just taking over the world, that company. And yet, Apple could buy them about 80 times over just with the money in their bank. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't talk about Apple. All right. Uh, some comments here. Herb from uh, Cross Spectrum Labs heard a discussion about Matt's custom apartment built in uh, his apartment build in Australia and wanted to inform us and Matt that sound absorptive plaster does, in fact, exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Really? Anyways, it's uh, it's very expensive, he warns, mainly because installing it is a multi-layered, time- and labor-intensive process that needs to be done by trained professionals. Different colors are available, but the dye needs to be pre-mixed. You cannot use normal paint after installa installation, which makes sense. You would, mm -hmm. whatever, sound absorbent. So, Matt, there you go. 
you'll have to ship in some dudes from <laughs> America to make it happen. But uh, or maybe I don't know. Maybe they have them in Australia too. But yes, it exists. Mm-hmm. So and here here are that. here are some details, some names to look out for if you want to. All right. So Pyrock, right? P Y R O K. Excuse me. Offers full plaster solutions, but to, to be effective across a fairly wide range of frequencies, it needs to be quite thick and requires reinforced wire grids if used on the ceiling. So the Baswa Baswa Fawn B A S W A new word P H O N solution might work better in Matt's case. It's essentially a mineral wood layer with a special marble based top coating. That's a mineral wool actually. So uh, same. What did I like say? You said wood. Uh, so mineral oh, wool, wool. Yeah, uh, layer, like, exactly like rock wool, you know, the type of insulation you would have inside of your walls. So it's a layer of that with like uh, then a, a special marble based type of coating on top of that. Do you want your ceiling to look like marble <laughs> well i mean you can again texture and dye the marble to look like just about anything uh can't okay. paint it afterwards so that one seems to be a little easier the the pyrock one is interesting i mean i was looking at their solutions and like if you put up a half inch thick layer which would you know be akin to a normal drywall layer it's basically only effective at two kilohertz like with a window oh, to from maybe one to four kilohertz mm. right with the peak definitely being at two kilohertz and to have anything outside of that it needs to be at least an inch probably an inch and a half thick which is a lot of weight when it's all yeah. plaster to be hanging off of your ceiling which is why they i, I mean it's not rebar but it's the idea of re, like a wire grid yeah, 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 to yeah, like yeah, yeah. Yeah. hold in all, so it's a lot to put in that pyrox system um yeah the the boswa fawn system looks more reasonable to me but uh very labor intensive for that too so. All right, Matt, let us know if uh, you look into those mm-hmm. and what you decide to do. And if you do install one of those, please take lots of pictures mm-hmm. and send them to us. Yeah, because the finished it, thing, you can't really tell. By looking at the finished pictures, you're like, that looks like drywall or plaster. It's all the right. stuff underneath that you can't see that was done beforehand. Right. Yeah. All right, Aaron. Aaron's the president of AC Customs in Canada. He wanted to mention for Stefan, who was looking to add an inexpensive sound bar to his Pioneer Curo monitor in his bedroom, that even though Curo, uh, the Curo monitors do have uh, what appears to be an optical audio output, it's not a normal Toslink output. You cannot plug all of your sources into the HDMI inputs of your Curo monitor and then have it send the audio out to the sound bar. All of the audio needs to be handled externally, which in retrospect makes sense yeah it is a pro monitor it is not a tv so it doesn't have a tuner in there it doesn't have anything audio wise in there uh as far as that goes so you can't use your curl monitor like a hdmi audio switch yeah. as you could with a normal TV. So, that, I mean, that's okay. Um, I mean, as long as you've... Because, I mean, most sound bars have more than one input. Uh, mm-hmm. And you might you might be looking at a combination of an optical switch and, an, you know, a regular red and white RCA switch or something like that. But, I mean, both of those can be gotten super cheap. You don't have to be going yeah. and getting a full AV receiver to do that type and of And if you're running an HDMI cable up to your Curo anyway, it's running an optical cable right next to it isn't, it's not right. really a big deal. <laughs> so, all right. All right, Chris. Chris wanted to mention for Zach, who who asked last week if it's worth trying to get the networking hardware in his den receiver repaired outside of warranty, that it's worth checking if he automatically gets extended warranty coverage from his credit card. Chris says that the HDMI board in his Denon X4300H malfunctioned after he was past the manufacturer's warranty period, but thankfully the staff at his local repair shop told him to check with his credit card company indeed. He had extended warranty coverage through them. He had to upload some paperwork and file a claim based on the estimate given to him by the repair shop, but it was worth that small hassle as the credit card company paid the repair bill in full for him. So this is quite literally news to me. <laughs> I have no problem on this podcast admitting my ignorance on things, and this is uh, this is one that would never have crossed my mind in a million years. I, I have certainly seen in the agreements yeah. and uh, you know features and perks and stuff. Yep, extended coverage oh, yeah. on everything that you buy is just something that uh, yeah I didn't think to mention. It didn't cross my mind at all. So Chris, thank you for mentioning that because it is a good thing to keep good in one. mind. Certainly doesn't hurt yeah. to check. 
And Martin on Twitter wanted to share the three-part guide to designing a home theater by Dr. Floyd Tool. It's a highly condensed summary of topics covered in his book, Sound Reproduction, that quickly covers the basics of room acoustics, sound system layout and setup, and speaker and amplifier requirements. It contains page references for the full book for further reading. Martin thinks it's a great resources, resource that our listeners might appreciate. So thank you very much, Martin. Yep. Uh, for anyone who was just saying, I'd like to read up on some of this stuff and get a little better understanding of acoustics and layout and how much amplifier power I need in general and that. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good primer for all of that type of stuff. Yeah. All right, let's get some questions in here. Mike. Mike says, thanks for all the suggestions we made regarding his room treatments and the plan that Gick put together for him. We said that how almost all of it could be done DIY by building super chunks and just using basic framing and fabric for the... Uh, uh, for a lot of the rest. He's run out of money in his budget to do everything in the way of room treatments all at once, so he's prioritizing what should he tackle first. Uh, I think he needs a stand for a center channel. <laughs> you know, that's okay. These are older pictures. I'm still using I, some of the first ones he sent in. I know. It's a, it's a funny, it's a funny picture because it, it looks like it's got two receiver boxes underneath it <laughs> It's uh, two it boxes for the bird uh, on wall speakers. That oh, he's got those on the wall speakers. It okay. gets them up to about the right height, so that's okay. Uh, but yeah, so uh, if you are prioritizing your acoustic treatments, that remember he was saying he actually has an outright bit of a slap echo still, even though he is fully carpeted in here. Um, you right. know, other than that, he doesn't really have anything. He's got a coffered ceiling, uh, you know, large deep bays in his ceiling, nothing in any of those or on the rest of the lowered part of the ceiling and nothing on the walls of the back wall. So it's just the carpet in there right now, uh, as far as anything absorptive goes. So what's first things first? Well, I mean, if you've got a slap echo that you're worrying about, then it's back wall first. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's really first reflection points, back wall. Those are the first two things I do. And no what. those could definitely be DIY. Um, yes. You know, we were talking about how on the sidewalls, this was actually Gick's idea, but we fully agreed with it, on the sidewalls up front. So I agree with Gick's notion of, you know, he's basically got this space going from where the screen is on the sidewall, you know, uh, parallel to the screen or perpendicular to the screen on the sidewall up to sort of the door on the left and the niche that he's got for his equipment on the right. Um, mm. Since he wants to do it DIY, just put in framing on both sides the whole way on the sidewall you know uh three inch thick framing basically regular insulation in there and cover the whole thing in fabric because that's one of the easiest and least expensive things that you could do and that will help as far as the front sound staging and imaging goes and then your back wall could be a similar thing you want to go thicker on the back wall if you can i mean if you can do like six inches thick that'd be great um, you know, do at least. I four. bet that's gonna uh, that's gonna be in front of his rear speaker, six inches. That's true. I would think. Yeah. But try try to do I at would. least four uh, on that back wall. That should work all right. And again, that could be DIY. I'm not sure. I think he he was talking about how he might want to have some printed panels, but I think that was only on the sides at the back. How do you feel about ordering things from back. Ghana? <laughs> that's right. Well, that's just the other <laughs> thing. You could just do some basic black panels at the back, and then get printed fabric and just tack that on top later if you want the printed image so yeah. that's a that's a great way to i'm out. absolutely in love with this idea yeah. by the way yeah. now that i've seen that theater i'm in love with it you, you could do 100%. it in your own i my panels are two by two 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 feet by two feet now all of every panel in here except for that one which is two by four and that one's less than two by four because of the wall it's on is not too you can still do it wide. you can get something printed on fabric and put it on there sure yeah i could yeah uh, so yeah, uh, all that's good. So he wants to double check. What's the function of the toggle switch on his Focal Super Bird speakers? It says one setting is for on wall and the other setting is for on stand. So he obviously went with the on wall setting in his case, but what does that switch actually do? Well, it does is it kind of change, kind of, it changes the crossover and some of the voicing of the speaker so that well, sure it takes into a crossover. I thought it was just the well, low end. I thought it was just the... Well, um, I mean, and that's part... I mean, you they, they, that's changing the crossover. I mean, how is that not changing well, no, the crossover? Well, no, because the crossover you, you is... the low end filter on The it. crossover is where the woofer is meeting the tweeter. I thought it was right. only the low end, the low pass for the woofer. Could be. I think so, that's what it's changing. Yeah. So basically what it does is it takes into account the the wall reinforcement mm -hmm. that's going to happen you got that you got that hard surface right behind you the base is going to wrap around the the speaker and then bounce off that back wall and uh you're that is going to amplify those lower frequencies so it just kind of yeah it's a it's a boundary a compensation switch um it basically just makes it so that when you are on the wall it is playing the deeper bass that it's able to play a little quieter that's pretty much all it is. When it's on stands and out away from the walls, it boosts up 
the deep bass that the speaker is able to play a little bit because it's not getting that boundary reinforcement. Yeah, it may be it, you know, it may be exactly the opposite of what we just said too. It may be it does nothing when it's next to a wall and then it boosts oh, the see. bass when it's out right. in the room. You know, it may it, it, we don't exactly it just know means what it away does. Away from the wall but, on a stand, the bass will be louder. You get more bass. Yeah. Yeah. One way or another, either by <laughs> curtailing it when it's in the on wall right. switch or by boosting it when it's in the on stand switch. But yeah, yeah. somewhere in there. Either way, so. away from the wall, bass is louder. Yeah. From the speaker itself. Justin. Justin says that he is totally blind, but he still enjoys home theater. And since for him, audio is 100% of the experience, he's excited to try Atmos. And dude, if anybody's going to enjoy it, it's going to be mm-hmm, you. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Your hearing is a lot better than the rest of us, probably. A lot more acute. So he's in the open style apartment. So his space is about 17 feet wide by 20 feet, uh, 25 feet long by 9 feet high. That's a nice size. Mm -hmm. He's sitting eight feet from his front wall, and there's lots of space behind him. So he's set up by 5.1 surround sound system. And so as far as the floor level goes, he would like to keep it that way. His surround speakers are seven feet to either side and just slightly behind a seat. That sounds perfect. He'd like to get... I know it does to me too. He'd like to get two pairs of speakers that could be mounted on his ceiling as Atmos overheads. This is a rental apartment, so uh, no in-ceiling speakers. And he'd like them to be a small, easy to mount, and three hundred dollars max for all four. He said two pair. Oh, two pairs. Yeah, two sorry. Pair. Uh, what would we suggest? Well, the okay. So we would have suggested the Focal Little like Birds those anymore. The back when birds. they were available, but they are no longer available, so can't do that. Are the how much of the Boston Acoustic ones? Yeah, so the Boston Acoustic Soundware four point five, which you can get from Accessories for Less, are seventy dollars each. So that oh, that's under three hundred bucks. Perfect. Four of them <laughs> yeah. would be just under three hundred dollars. Seventy dollars yeah. each for those Boston Soundware. Now, um, so he won't be able to see the. They're not tiny. Though. They are not I tiny. Mean, it is a four and a half inch woofer, and then there is yeah. a case around that. So they are not teeny teeny tiny, but they also aren't gigantic. They are definitely very easy to mount. They come with an integrated pivot mount that's built right into them. Uh, Very easy to just put in there with some drywall anchors because they are not super heavy, so they don't have to go into a stud that isn't necessary. Some basic drywall anchors, you'd put that in with the integrated mount that comes with it, and you can, I mean, we're going to tell you to just aim them straight down, but if you want to, there it's a full pivot ball mount. You can aim them whatever direction you please if you so choose. Yeah. That's that would be my kind of go to. I'm glad that I'm finally able to recommend these speakers. I saw them before they were released mm-hmm. at a Boston Acoustic event, and it was you know, at the time I thought they were you know whole home audio, mm. maybe surround you know surround surround back duty, but I didn't really see much of a use for them. But suddenly with Atmos, these things have I have a new lease on and life. Also as far before as I'm concerned. they were at accessories for less, they were like a one and a half times more expensive yeah, yeah, than yeah. they are now. So they're much more affordable and they fit a, a good use case for that. I will also mention uh, in case, because uh, he's saying that you know, even though he's not seeing that he still cares very much about aesthetics, that's coming up in the next part of his question. But for the speakers as well, if you have a white ceiling and you would prefer a white finish on the speaker, uh, Kef's E301, that is a discontinued speaker uh, at this point, but Accessories for Less still has some available for sale. Uh, so that is available in a white finish. Now, those they're selling for $200 for a pair. So that would be over the budget he's looking for, be $400 right. for two pairs of them. I thought the Soundware had all kinds of different uh, uh, well, colors. I only see that, that was their deal. I only see black available at Accessories for Less, though. That might be the truth. Yeah. That, that might be true. But they're, they, I, I know when I saw them, mm. they had them in red. They do and look white like the type of speaker that would easily come in other finishes. So. They had all kinds of finishes. So, might be worth the calling accessories sure. for less and seeing if that's an option. If you, you know, if, if somebody cares about the color of their speakers on their ceiling. So, yeah. All right, he says he won't be seeing wires, but he still cares about the cleanliness of the setup and the aesthetics of his apartment. Is there some way to do this wirelessly so that the wire won't have to run up the ceiling? Uh, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> even if you did that, you would still have to plug in whatever it was that was up there that was wirelessly receiving the uh, the signal. Yeah, there would so, still be wires be and you would still wire. need power connectors and that it would yeah. it would not look clean like you're hoping for this this isn't right some not without yeah. installing the wires in the ceiling so right. just for just so that we we are all understanding in order to be wireless mm-hmm. you have to have a wireless transmitter at the source mm-hmm. and a wireless receiver at the 
speaker. Yes. Okay. The wire and each one of those things is going to need power. Yes. So yes, you will not have to run a speaker wire, but you will have to run Romex, right? You know, or you have to plug it in. And then, now this is fine if you are going from the front of the room to the back of the room, where there's wall outlets everywhere behind couches and stuff, and you can just plug stuff in. Well, then it looks wireless. Sure. But on a ceiling, that's not the case. Yeah, and then you would still, this would be the wireless receiver in this case would also have to be an amplifier. And those do exist, like Amphony, yeah. the company that we recommend yeah. often. That's A-M-P-H-O-N-Y, by the way, Amphony. Um, they, they do have where the wireless receiving unit is also an amplifier. They have also uh, one where it's like a stereo amplifier, so it powers two speakers, or individual amplifiers. You get one separate little receiving amplifier unit for each speaker, but then you still need to run a speaker wire from that to the speaker. Mm. So it's not mm -hmm. truly... I mean, if, you're, if your idea is, I won't see anything up there except for these little speakers, nope, that's not going to be the way it looks. So instead yeah. of that, what I would recommend to you is flat, paintable, self-adhesive speaker wire which is readily available from Sewell they call it ghost wire and uh, yeah it's it's just this flat white self-adhesive and paintable uh, speaker wire that you can just stick to your wall uh, I mean if you don't want to paint it you don't have to if you're okay with just the flat I mean if your walls and ceiling are already white and this is close enough then you don't even have to bother painting it uh, but yeah flat and self-adhesive, easy to run up there. You do need some little uh, blocks at each end that convert the super duper flat wire back into something regular speaker wire can connect to. Uh, but you mm -hmm. just get these little plastic terminal blocks that uh, terminate on either end. That can be quite easily hidden just in behind the speaker uh, up on the ceiling. So you don't have to see that little terminal block. And uh, that's about it. That's what I would Your recommend. other option, of course, is going to be... Um like uh, wire tracks, you know, sure, that you yeah, see raceways. people use raceways that you could do, and that those are also paintable and uh, you know easily installed and uninstalled. They don't weigh anything, so you don't have to worry about any of that. And some of them may even be adhesive, mm -hmm. so then it would just require a little bit of painting afterwards. Yeah. Uh, those are a little bit more noticeable than what Rob's talking about. They are easier to install mm. than what Rob is talking about, but uh, you at least have a couple options there. So diagrams for speaker layout are of new, no use to him. He's heard how Atmos speakers should go just in line with the front and surround back speakers, but he doesn't have surround back speakers and the surrounds are quite far apart. So could we please explain uh, exactly where he should uh, ceiling mount his four Atmos speakers for the best angles and imaging? Well, uh, in your case, you should put them in line with your front speakers, unless your front speakers are somehow oddly placed <laughs> <You> know, right <laughs> basically i i would put them you know basically over or just outside of the outside of your couch whatever mm. your couch is that you're sitting on i think that that's that's sort of a good guide but generally speaking you want your you know your speakers should be outside of the seating area so that you know the imaging is your, your main left and right speakers should be you know so that your couch is inside of those two speakers mm -hmm. generally speaking not always but generally speaking that should be the way it is and then uh, these those speakers would be in line with those now the surround speakers for a lot of reasons are gonna are not going to be in that but the surround backs you would be in line uh, it's kind of that track over your head like an arc over your head uh, but if they're not perfectly in line with each other, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it's I mean, <laughs> if you were able to see the diagrams, uh, a lot of this stuff is described in angles. And yeah. so to convert it into something that I think is easier to understand, which is just give you some feet measurements that you could go by. In your case, since you are sitting eight feet away from your front wall, uh, if you were to go by the angles suggested, it would translate into your Atmos speakers above you being somewhere in the range of seven to nine feet apart which sounds pretty reasonable if you have a normal sized couch that's probably yep. six and a half or seven feet wide, then saying that your uh, Atmos speakers are gonna be somewhere in the range of seven to nine feet apart from each other, uh, that, that makes it easy. And then since you have a nine foot ceiling, I'm gonna suggest to you that they go five feet in front of you and five feet behind you. Uh, because normally that's they're saying uh, yeah, that yeah, yeah. they'd go for like a 45 degree elevation angle, which if you have an eight foot ceiling would put them probably exactly five feet in front, five feet behind. But I don't want to go too far in front, too far behind, uh, you know, yeah. to, to stay at that exact 45 degree elevation angle. You're allowed to have your top front, and your top rear speakers as much as a 55 degree elevation angle. So five feet in front of you, five feet behind you would be a 50 degree elevation angle. It's perfectly within the recommended angles. 
and I think that's a good distance. So seven to nine feet apart and five feet in front, five feet behind. Yeah. All right, Carl. Carl wants some new power protection. He has he was using two 20-year-old Rotel line conditioners for all of his networking and AV gear. Each Rotel unit had has nine outlets, and he's using them all. One of them died, so he'd like to replace it, and he'd rather just replace both Rotel units at the same time. So what would we suggest? Uh, do you need battery backup? Right. I'm guessing he that's the real question uh because he's just asking for line conditioning and power protection so i mean i love to recommend battery backup anyway because you pretty much you never regret it, having it but if you don't need it you can save money yes yeah. yeah so if you don't need it then uh well we're gonna recommend apc no yeah it's gonna what. be apc <laughs> across the board so the brand is easy it's gonna be apc and a tip for people who are in the u.s or canada since they also ship to canada very easily bh photo uh bnh photo video yeah they're a great place to buy APC products, yeah. often less expensive than Amazon getting from And them. honestly, APC, you quite literally do not need our advice. Just look <laughs> at the back panel I and suppose. say, does this, have, does this have everything on here that I need? Because uh, every single product that they make is bulletproof. I mean, yeah. it is as protected as it can be at that price point, you know, or at that, you know, whatever. They are UL certified, the whole nine yards. They... they that thing will sacrifice itself. Now, if you were in a, an area that you were complaining that things were dying constantly because of spikes and stuff like that, we might send you to, what's that other company that we can talk about? Surgex. We would send you there. They are a little bit, you know, they're a lot pr pr pricier, but, you know, their units are... Even beefier uh, and non-self-sacrificial. They don't sacrifice themselves to save yeah. your gear. The APC stuff does sacrifice itself. If you get yeah. hit with lightning, it will hopefully yeah. protect you, uh, but it will sacrifice itself to do it. The, if you're getting hit with lightning all the time, you do want to go Surge X. That's, that's yeah. what they're best for. Yeah. So if if you want battery backup, you're going to want to go with the J series, mm -hmm. and you may need more than one, or you may need a J series and then one of the. Was he it, wanted to get two one? units H? anyway. Yeah. So yeah the, yeah, the H units are basically the J units minus a battery. So no right. battery backup in the H units, but I, otherwise the same. So the one I love is the J15. Uh, this okay. is a unit that has 12 outlets on the back, all of them battery protected. Uh, mm. 10 of those outlets do limit you to 12 amps, and two of them are labeled as high current, and those let through the full 15 amps. And it's unusual to find 15 amp plus battery backup. So mm. that's what the J15 offers you, and it's a tremendous unit. It does go for about $530, though, so it's not super inexpensive. If you right. go over to the H15, which subtracts the battery, it's like half the price. It's $270. And I'll be honest with you, I think I got the H10 yeah. for like a hundred bucks on sale <laughs> someplace. So, you know, the H10 basically just subtracts a couple of outlets, you know. Right. And uh, I mean, basically what I'm saying is if you're not desperate to get one right now, you know, Black Friday is your friend mm. because APC units go on sale all the time for Black Friday. So you can definitely pick up uh, these things on sale as well. Right. But, but both, if you need battery backup, this is this is the one I would get. Yeah, both the J15 and the H15, they give you independent filter banks. So if you have anything that's got moving parts, a fan or spinning hard drive or something, put it into one of the uh, smaller filter banks so that it's electrically isolated from your other devices that don't have any moving parts because usually it's a moving part that creates an electrical noise if it's anything uh, like I say 12 units all of them battery backed up in the J15 now if you want something a little less expensive and you didn't need quite so many outlets now he needs a minimum of 18 so 18 is a lot this is giving you 24 <laughs> uh, but there is the J35 which goes for about $380 this is a battery backup unit but still has the full voltage regulation just like the J15 and the H15 do and filtering and all the rest of its surge protection uh, but this one has eight outlets six of which are battery backup two of which are surge only only. That's on the J35 that I'm talking about now. So, I right. mean, you could do a combination of like a J35 and an H15 because maybe you want some battery backup for a few devices and the J35 can do that for six devices and then you'd have another 12 outlets from an H15 and altogether that's pretty darn reasonable for some excellent line conditioning and power protection. Yeah. Uh, on the YouTube video, you may be thinking it's raining because it is storming here. Ah, okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm going to try to remember on the on the podcast to noise reduce that out, but we'll <laughs> see. 
So he's got a bunch of Sonos units throughout this house, and he'd like to have some surge protection for them, but many of them are in small spaces where there isn't room for a power strip. Any suggestions? Is there any such thing as a surge protector that's built to fit within a regular single gang outlet box to just replace the regular outlet? Um, yes, I think. Those do exist. I'm not a big fan of them. Um, so, for example, Best Buy sells their own under the Insignia brand. It goes for about $40, and it is a unit that just fits inside of a regular single gang box. Um, there was another company, one of the other surge protection companies that have one. Uh, the reason I'm not a big fan of it is because there's one of the specifications you're going to look for on any surge protector, which is the let-through voltage. And yeah. ideally, it's uh, close to or less than 300 volts. You don't really want to let through voltage any higher. Than, like 330 is sort of the normal IEEE standard that they look for, 330 volts let through. And these in, well, in, in gang box ones don't have that. They're at best 600, and some of them aren't even rated, which means they could be as much as 900 or 1,000 volt let through, which yeah, basically might as well not have it. I mean, it might prevent, I don't, I don't know what that would prevent nothing doesn't really help you so they're almost they're almost not worth having what i would recommend much more highly uh is back to apc they have these units uh one of them in the av lineup is called the p4v now this just plugs in where your normal plug is and it does protrude from the wall somewhat but keep this in mind what it does is it gives you outlets on its sides which are 300 volt let through protected. So it's actually good surge protection on there. Keep in mind that, I mean, just think about any normal plug or wall wart. It sticks out from the outlet a bit. This really doesn't stick out from the outlet anymore. And then it puts the outlets on the sides. So in terms right. of how much is protruding from the outlet, not much more. Now, uh, they do have in their APC Essentials line one called the P6WU2, which gives you six side-mounted outlets. But what I like about that one is it gives you integrated USB plugs. So you can just plug USB devices directly into it oh. without needing an adapter. Uh, although it is only 2.4 amp. It's not the 5 amp USB. Mm. So uh, it's uh, it'd be the slow charging on a lot of things. But I, I it's... Easy it's plugged in all I the like. time. How 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 much how much charging does it? Yeah. Need? Oh, by the way, the P4V goes for about twenty eight dollars, and the P6W is only fourteen bucks. So pretty inexpensive. So lastly, he's thinking it might be a good idea to have some surge protection for his SVS cylinder subs. What are our suggestions for that? Well, SVS and almost every subwoofer manufacturer will tell you do not do this. Mm. Uh, they will tell you plug directly into the wall. They have fuses mm -hmm. that are melt, meant to protect their subs, and they would prefer if they their subs had access to the full amount of power yes. that is available to them. Because you know you might decide to watch something at you know greater than full reference volume and it has a big you know hit that the sub you know has to empties all of its capacitors all at once and then asks for a whole bunch of power in in. A surge protector right. in a lot of cases will throttle that mm -hmm. and we've seen cases where uh the, the the amplifier within the sub is asking for a bunch of power that the 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 unit the surge protector says hey that looks like a surge i better clamp down mm -hmm. on it so then <laughs> then the amplifier says no no i really need it and then the <laughs> surge protector is like no no this is definitely a surge i better clamp down on it it goes back and forth until somebody blows a fuse yep so uh they would rather you plug directly into the wall and they will tell you that, you know, a fuse, a couple dollar fuse is, will protect that sub and that's it. But if you're going to get a surge protector because of reasons and you decide you're going to do it no matter what, you need to get one that allows the full voltage through 100% access to what's there. Yep. Uh, and uh, APC will have you there as well. They, since we've already talked about it before. They do, yeah. Uh, these are actually I use on my own SVS subs. It's the P8V. Uh, going up a little ways on the AV lineup, the P8V. Now, this is just a surge protector and EMI RFI filter. It's not a voltage regulator. It's not a battery backup. Uh, but it does provide surge protection. Uh, again, that 300 volt let through at max. Uh, but the reason I go with the P8V and not the P4V that I mentioned before, which is even smaller and just plugs into the wall, is because the P8V is the lowest price model they offer that lets through the full 15 amps. The other ones clamp you down at 12. So this is $45 from B&H. Uh, and it's got actually a pretty nice design in that because I think one of the things you want to do is sort of hide this. Now, it's slim and kind of long. I just have mine sort of sitting alongside the base of my cylinder sub. But it also has just four-way keyhole mounts. You could actually just hang it on the wall. Like sort of yeah. like if you've got your cylinder almost like corner loaded, this could just be like 
on the wall in behind the cylinder upright where you would never see it. So Yeah, what you would want to do in that case is make sure that the the, the, the screws that you're using for the keyhole mm -hmm. are just out enough yeah. <laughs> to and or you're gonna put some sort of rubber or something yeah. between the, the or just felt. thing in the wall. Yeah. yeah, felt, whatever. All right, Ben on Twitter. Ben says, what are some quality in wall speaker choices? What do we th think of the RBH Visage series? Uh, I don't know the Visage series on, you know, off the top of my head, but they, RBH is pretty honest about their speakers. Mm -hmm. If they cost more, it's because they're better. If they cost <laughs> less, it's because they had to cut s some corners. And generally speaking, they, the corners are extension <laughs> you know they don't sacrifice flat frequency response they'll sacrifice extension mm -hmm. or you know aesthetics or, or maximum like output that. level or maximum output level exactly yeah. so if the visage series is cheap well then that's why and if it's expensive then they're real good i mean uh, basically rbh has consolidated their in wall series now uh so they used to have sort of their entry level series which were like a a616 and things like that they now have mm -hmm. everything for that used to be there just under the Visage VA series. And those are the least expensive ones. They uh, they sort of just got rid of the ones that used to have the non-magnetic grills. The Visage series used to be the ones that started the magnetic grills. Well, now everything just has magnetic grills. So yeah. it's the VA series is the least expensive. And then the VM series uses the upgraded M series drivers, which are drivers that I personally really, really like. It's the same ones yeah. they're using in the Impression Elite series now. The Impression Elite series got those M series drivers. So I'm a big, big fan of the VM series for sure. I think those are very high quality quality in wall speakers really good drivers and one thing that i like about rbh is that they have options for backer boxes and back cans for all of their in wall and in ceiling models there is a way to put a rear enclosure on everything including retrofit so mm. i like that very much i am quite a big fan of rbh's visage series especially the vm series with those upgraded m series drivers yeah, and if you're not looking there, you can always look at the Pyrian. It's another yes. one that we recommend on the regular. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's tons of ones that we recommend. So I, I, I'm gonna, it depends on what you mean by quality, too. Mm -hmm. Is it quality for price or just quality? Because if you're talking about high-end in-ceiling and in-wall speakers, there's lots of them out there uh, that exist. And there, some of them are donkulously expensive. <laughs> well, I mean, there's so, RBH's own uh, signature series, which is stepping right. up things and actually comes with a fully integrated back box. Like it's part of the, you just buy it that way. It's already got the cabinet. Yeah, it just cut the hole and sink it, it in. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so I, within RBH's own lineup, there's something higher. I mean, KEF is going to be one that goes all yeah. the way from, the, I mean, they have ones that are just the CI models, then the Q series, the R series, all the way up to their top of the line THX series. And I will wholeheartedly easily recommend KEF in walls to anybody. Uh, but if you're going for uh, sort of more middle of the road price, like $150 per speaker, Aperion, like Tom said, or HSU is one that I also like to recommend sometimes, right in that sort of $150 per speaker's price range. If you need something that's horn loaded and a bit more efficient, HSU's in wall speakers are a nice option. And then if you're just like, I want the least expensive, but still decent quality, I like Monoprice's new Sycamore series. I think they're a good okay value they're about a hundred dollars a pair you know so definitely not expensive uh but pretty nice quality drivers in there so i think that runs the gamut from very inexpensive in the monoprice sycamore through mid-range and then to high end yeah i mean you can even go like legacy audio they have in-wall options oh, as sure. well and that's good and i mean that's Par be... paradigm has some wonderful in-walls yeah so i mean there's there's a lot out there focal so too focal has sure has a gamut from not yeah. Not crazy expensive to crazy expensive. So, yeah. <laughs> so he says, does placing sound absorption like Owens Corian 703 on the inside of a sheetrock wall do anything as far as room acoustics go? Would having three inches of absorption on the inside of a wall and four inches of absorption on the outside of the wall be the same thing as having a seven inch base trap on the outside? And the answer is no. No. Nope. So uh, what it does is uh, it, it's going to make your wall more inert and it's going to help sound passage through the actual wall. Now, does that mean that it's going to not be able to get around the wall through like an outlet <laughs> or underneath a door or through the door or whatever? No. So, you know, that that's about the only 
uh, thing that does. Now, I put tons of insulation, not just regular insulation, not Owens Corning 703 or any of that stuff. I put regular insulation all through the wall between my home theater and uh, the main room. Yeah, this is an and in it helps. interior wall, so you're not doing this for thermal purposes like you are on no. an exterior wall. This is on the in interior walls of Tom's house. Yeah. He's got insulation in there. And I did that to, to try to keep as much sound from passing through as possible. Yeah, that was a sound that mean proofing measure. Yeah, it's not much of a, it does not much of a measure because it goes right under the door mm. and through the door. So, you know, at, at, if I'm listening too late uh, at night at near reference volumes, mm -hmm. which Tom has been known to do mm -hmm. from time to time when he decides he's going to watch Infinity War at midnight <laughs> on a Friday after a couple of beers, uh, his wife comes in and yells at him. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not the same thing as having a seven inch bass trap. The four inch the the four inches inside the wall uh, or inside the uh, the room is ba is trapping the stuff inside the wall is just for sound uh, uh, acoustic I mean yeah um, yes like one of the easiest sense. ways to think let's say you had a room that literally echoed right if you put insulation right. inside the walls so it's still a hard surface that you're seeing you're still going to have an echo it did nothing as right. far as the acoustics inside the room now outside of the room on the other side of that wall on the room on the other side it might be a little bit quieter because now any side that penetrated the hard wall and normally would have bounced around inside the wall cavity now that's getting absorbed inside the wall cavity so the sound doesn't pass as easily from room to room but inside the room where you are where it's echoing it's still echoing you put up four inches of insulation within the room you know on the outside of the drywall walls now you've reduced that echo and if you put seven inches then you're reducing that echo down into the base but having the right. inside of the wall treated that's for helping to prevent sound transmission from room to room not the echo and if you were side. just to put like a couple of panels up on your wall and expected that to be soundproofing you oh, would no. also not work no. okay because it's going to go it's going to go around those panels and through the wall on either side of the yeah. panels i mean it, it's just the way that that works so it's the same sort of deal if you said oh i want to soundproof my room i put up you know panels on my wall and it Will that help? And the answer is right. no. To Those that two as well. things do get confused very often. Sometimes people yeah. are like, I want to soundproof. Can I just put up some fluffy stuff in, you know, uh, within my room? I didn't open up the walls or anything. I just, within my yeah. room, I put up some fluffy stuff. Is that going to stop the sound from getting to the room beside me? Nope. And also, nope. if I did open up the walls and put it in, uh, insulation in there and then drywalled back up, is that going to help the echoes inside my room? Nope. It's the same material, insulation, but it's doing two different jobs. That's right. Infinite Gary, one of Gary's neighbors, is moving to a new residence where she won't have cable TV service. She has about 150 hours of standard deaf content saved on her cable DVR, and she would still like to be able to watch those recordings. A cable TV tech suggested using a DVD recorder to move everything off the DVR. Do we have any recommendations? I, you're, I they suggested that really. I don't. Yeah. That's that's something that I don't think they even let you did, do. <laughs> I mean, I think they. Well, I mean, not only do, do they not want you to do it, but I don't. I think that you have to have some sort of weird workaround to make it happen because they don't want you doing that. That's the whole idea of HDMI to begin with. Yeah, well, you can't do it with a digital connection. You can do it with a analog, analog. video connection because nothing much can stop a composite video output from going into a VCR and then recording it in real time. So, and that's I mean, true. this is all standard def content. So, I mean, that solution would work. You would literally have to record each show in real time, at which point. Yeah. Haven't you just watched everything that was on the cable DVR? <laughs> but I guess not, because you could have stuff. It's a, how many hours? It's 150, 150 hours? Now, that's going to take a bit. Gary you know, did that's mention, a lot of well, VHS it's going to take 150 tapes. hours. So, <laughs> so, I mean, it could be done on a VCR, or it could be done... But you have to sit there every hour and start it again. Yeah, well... I mean, it's not like you can just have it keep going. You could have it go for six hours on an extended long play VHS tape, or yeah. you can get about, what, but four hours on the, good the, quality on a DVD? Yeah, but the, if the, each show was an hour long, you still have to press play on the cable. Oh, on the DVR, the cable you're box. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So every hour for 150 hours straight, you're gonna, or every half hour, yeah, <laughs> for 100, depending on which shows you recorded, you gotta have to do this. Is so I mean, is, that'll work. I mean, the, there is no. You know, you know what my solution is? Steal the DVR. Yeah. Take bring it the, with you when you move. Because some, I've, I've in Canada, we have the instance where. Um, so the DVR does need to be plugged into a cable outlet to function at all, but you don't necessarily have to have actual functioning cable subscription right. for it to just say, I am connected to the wall so I can play back what is already in my memory bank. So 
you could maybe just give that a try. You know, just bring your cable yes. DVR along to the new place, plug it in. You don't have any subscription. You don't have any actual service going, but sometimes that just works. So that might be the easiest. But uh, I, I mean, I don't know. There's no way to just like copy the hard drive it. because the hard yes. drive is all encrypted. So encrypted, there's no right. easy way to do that. I mean, you can do you could do it with just a VCR. You could do it with a DVD recorder. Those are a bit harder to find. Interestingly, the easiest place I could still find a DVD recorder at a not insane price was Walmart. Um, yeah, not the Walmart, Walmart store, but Walmart online. They still sell DVD yeah. recorders. So you can give that a try. You would just be recording it onto DVD-Rs. Uh, so, I mean, Lee Overstreet, He's like the man when it comes to archiving older SD content. But of course, he does it all on computer. So he's using yeah. a capture card. It would be pretty simple in this case because you're talking about a standard definition capture card. That could be one of the hop hog cards that works very well sure. for capturing standard def. But you'd still be recording it in real time now onto a computer's hard drive. That that It's just the recording medium we're talking about. Is it a VHS tape, tape a DVD-R, or a hard drive? But either way, you're just recording in real time. But I don't have a better solution than that. Right? You, you can't just... There is no better there isn't. solution You can't just that. copy an encrypted hard drive, which is what's in the DVR itself. Yeah. The easiest solution is to take the DVR with yeah. you and make it work. So, I mean... I don't know how to test that exactly. Yeah. If you have different cable surfaces than she has or something like that, she could bring it to your house or vice versa or whatever and see if it will, if she could plug it into the wall and it'll still play. Yeah. Um, but that's really the solution. The solution is to keep the DVR box. Yeah, Gary, and tell them, Gary oh, yeah. did say in a later email that a lot of it was like pretty much the entire run of MASH. And so he's just getting her to buy the box set because yeah. that was a lot of it. <laughs> Why would anybody need the entire run of Mash? If that's your favorite show, and now she'll have a box. I, mean, I liked Rash. I liked. I liked Matt. I said Rash. You did say I liked Rash. Mash just fine. I don't like Rashes that much. Yeah. So a high def D digest posted an article titled "Is 4K a Scam?" The answer is yes. <laughs> they detailed how they get uh, asked every day about real versus fake 4K, since most movies you still use 2K resolution digital intermediaries, intermediates whatever and still use 2k resolution cgi effects they go through how ultra hd blu-rays and 4k streaming is a, about a lot more than just the number of pixels there's hdr and wide color high higher bit rates and more efficient compression codecs often atmos or dtsx are only found in the 4k version and perhaps the most important perhaps most importantly there's usually been a few remastering or even uh, i'm sorry a new remastering or even a full restoration done for the 4K release, and it's a lot more involved than just upscaling from 2 to 4K. What's our take on the subject in High Def Digest article? I didn't read the article, um, but I'll tell you, I agree. It is a it is a scam. But the reason I think it's <laughs> well, a scam is it's not a scam. In fact, <laughs> uh, no, but I agree with the people who are saying it's a scam. But the reason it's a scam is because the only reason that they're they're touting this 4K is because. They believe, rightly or wrongly, that people are too stupid mm. to be convinced to buy a new TV by anything other than the higher number mm. of pixels. And that's why they're pushing it. Now, all the rest of the stuff is not a scam. We, no one needed 4K. Mm. No, definitely nobody needs 8K. But no one needed 4K. I have the, the, the amount of people that have that sit so close to their screens that they were seeing pixels <laughs> in high def it, it, it's minuscule is absolutely minuscule and those people you know they, 4k displays were needed maybe in professional settings when people were uh uh you know medical you know they were zooming in to something and they're getting really close to the screen trying to see something sure 4k 8k 16k get all the k's you want over there that's fine but what is not a scam is all the rest of it now it is a scam that they're putting atmos and dtsx only on 4k discs right because that's, that's unnecessary entirely not a a uh technical reason why that should be the case because regular yeah, 1080 p blu-rays can entirely handle atmos and dtsx they're just gating that behind there and that's bs as far mm -hmm. as i'm concerned but the hdr mm-hmm the HDR is a real thing. Mm -hmm. It's a real thing that makes real sense for us to care about. But they don't think the public under can be convinced to buy a new TV based on having more colors. Even though many a marketing campaign has been built around having more colors. Does everybody remember the yellow pixel for Toshiba or whatever it was? That was sharp. That was sharp. That was sharp. Right. The yellow, the yellow pixel Aquos. is going to make all the difference. Right? And so we know that they... 
they sometimes will market it around color, but they, for whatever reasons, have decided that HDR is not enough. So they are going with this higher pixel count that a hundred percent of the people, as far as I'm concerned, don't need. <laughs> well, I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the article that High Def Digest was basically right on. Um, yeah. I, I agreed fully with essentially everything that was said in there. Um, and I mean, it is a it is a tough marketing thing because so I mean, I had the instance where somebody you know somebody i knew was always watching everything on their widescreen tv their new 16 by 9 tv everything was stretched <sighs> right because they were st they were still getting standard definition cable service so everything was coming in four by three in their cable box but of course the tv stretched it to fill the full screen and this person that i knew was convinced that that is what hd meant that if it didn't look <laughs> like that all weird and wide and distorted that you weren't watching hd like, in their mind, that's what HD meant. And in a lot of people's minds, what 4K means is, like, they'll see an OLED, and they'll be like, is that a 4K TV? And the person will be like, yes, it is, because, yeah, it is. They're not wrong. And now they're convinced that that's what 4K means. And then they'll see something else, and they'll be like, oh, that doesn't look as good as the OLED. It must not be 4K. And the person's like, well, it is 4K. And they're like, no, it can't be. Because it's not right. what I have now decided 4K means, right? So, it, yeah, uh, in trying to simplify everything to make it really easy for consumers, it has also caused confusion, which is always the case. Always That's what case, always yeah. happens. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, what they're specifically talking about are the people who are saying, we get this disc, we get by this Ultra HD Blu-ray. It has, it looks better. There's no question it looks better. It sounds better because for whatever reason, they gated the Atmos release only to this Ultra HD Blu-ray version and not the regular Blu-ray version. But I know because I went and looked it up on Blu-ray.com that they actually rendered all the CGI graphics in this movie at 2K resolution and they used a 2K intermediate. So even though the camera was like 3.5K because it was one of the red cameras, uh, you know, at some point everything was only had 2K number of pixels. Right. And therefore, this Ultra HD Blu-ray is fake 4K because... These are the same people who are buying high-def audio at 96 yeah. kilohertz. <laughs> These are the or same or people yes. who are like, oh, yeah, I, I only listen to high-res audio because it's that much better. No, it's not. It's <laughs> not. They just up-converted it. You know the thing you're complaining about with 4K? Mm -hmm. That's your high horse? That's the hill that you're going to die on? Yeah, it's the same thing with your stupid music, so shut up. <laughs> so Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think High Def Digest's attempt to clarify this stuff was very good. How many people will yeah. actually read and comprehend it, I have no idea. But uh, yeah, no, I'm in full agreement with them, Gary. <sighs> I, I'm just so irritated with 4K just in general, so <laughs> you, have to, you have to forgive me. Uh, and, and it's okay. You can just the skip one thing to I 8K, Tom. You can just skip straight to right. 8K. That's right. I'm going to go. I'm waiting for 32. Uh, one thing I will say is, yes, they're right that, that there's been partial remasters or full remasters, but let's all look at Thor Ragnarok as an example mm. of how that can go horribly wrong. <laughs> so just because they remastered it doesn't mean that they, it's any better. Sometimes it's worse. <laughs> so, you know, I in general in the future i believe that having an ultra hd 4k disc will mean that you get are having a better experience than what you would have had with just a straight blu-ray because of the better audio the higher dynamic range and the remastering but right now it's such a, such a new thing that there's not that much of it i want to say i was at a meeting the other day and I was talking about home theater. And I said, how many of you know that there's such a thing as a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray? Mm. And not a single hand mm. in that room of 30 people went up. Yeah, No one knows about it. No one knows what those discs are. No one. Yeah, they, If they're buying them, it's they don't know accident. why. <laughs> yeah. They have no idea why they're yeah. buying it. None at all. All right, Carl. Carl is using a Sen CMT340 speakers up front, some Polk Monitor Series bookshelf speakers, a surrounds and slim Polk OWM3 speakers overhead for Atmos. He'd like to get some different surround speakers that could be mounted on his side walls and stick out as little as possible, ideally less than four inches. He'd also like to keep the price around $200 for the pair. He's been eyeing the ELAC Debut 2.0, OW 4.2. Is there anything else that we would recommend more highly? He wants them to be very narrow. Very narrow from front to back. Mm -hmm. Wall and mountable. Wall mountable and cheap. 
around $200 a pair and match as close as you can reasonably expect to some Ascend CMT340 speakers. So he's been looking at the Elax. The Elac debut 2.0. Like. This is their on-wall model. And honestly, I think that's a pretty darn good choice there, Carl. Um, they are yep. about $230, but that's not wildly more expensive than what you were looking for. And they check all the boxes. They're just under four inches from front to back. Very easy to wall mount. Pretty darn easy to drive. And they're going for a neutral sound. I wouldn't call their tweeter the equal of the CMT340's right. tweeter. But, but it's a surround It's your surrounds. And they're not going yeah. for some wild characteristic sound. They're going for a pretty darn neutral and they just have a little bit of high-end roll-off, which honestly in your surrounds is very unobjectionable. I really wish RBH still sp sold those flat mm. speak on wall speakers. But they, they do. With the well, they have ports. the ultras. RBH does have yeah, the ultras, but, those but are they are be a lot more than not that. in yeah. this price range. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the other one that came that immediately came to my mind was those flat uh, KEF speakers that yeah, they the sold. Yeah, the T-Series. It'd be like the T-101. Those are super ex more expensive than this. Too. Well, not crazy more, but uh, well, they're about $250 each. So about right. $500 for the pair. So well more than what you're looking for. They are super flat and they'd be an all right I, choice, but not for this price. I mean, I naturally. Mean, how far away is he sitting from these speakers, does he say? He doesn't say. Uh, I mean, naturally, so, I was thinking Ascend's own HTM 200s. Because, uh, sure. of course, those will match timbre-wise perfectly to your CMT340s. But uh, they're about six inches from front to back. So they're a little bit deeper than he was hoping well, What about for. the NHTs? NHTs. Oh, NHT the should be. Yeah, the Super Zeros are going to be a little bit more than two hundred dollars a pair, but not more than two thirty. Uh, I don't think. Yeah, they're two fifty, two fifty, because okay. they're one twenty five each. Okay, and those those would be those smaller. Could work. Yep. Yeah, than any of this really. Yeah. And those would be a good a good match. Uh, There's also Aperians, uh, little Intimus four B satellites. Uh, mm. Those those could be another one. Again, they're about five inches deep. Uh, but they're the least expensive out of all of these. They're only $170 for a pair of those. What about the RBHs, the satellites? Do they still They have don't those? have those anymore. Ah, oh, you got to be kidding All of me. RBH's little stuff is gone. It's all what? gone. So, I mean, so the Ascend Acoustics, the HTM 200s, they're $300 for a pair. So they're definitely over the budget you were hoping for and a little deeper, but they would have the perfect timbre match. Uh, the NHT Super Zeros... Uh, very close in price to the ones that you're already looking at. The size is about right. Uh, Aperion's Intimus, that could also work. But do I have a reason to strongly point you away from the ELAC debut on wall 4.2s? Really. really, I don't. Uh, they check all the boxes and would be a very reasonable solution as your surround speakers mounted on a wall. Yeah. All right, Casey. Casey has plugged his uh, Roku Ultra into his Denon S510BT receiver and then connected his Denon via HDMI to his Vizio E65 TV. If the uh, Roku Ultra is set to output 1080p or 4K resolution, everything works fine. But as soon as he tries to set the Roku Ultra to output HDR, the screen goes black and he has to reset the uh, Roku Ultra to get it working again, at which point it defaults, at which point it defaults to outputting 1080p. His Visio TV says it supports HDR10, and the Denon S510BT uh, says it supports uh, HDMI 2.0 with HDR and HDCP 2.2. So it's a problem. There's just some setting he needs to change. Is this a bandwidth issue? It can't be. Well, it could possibly be because uh, I want to check the easy stuff first. Because sometimes, Lord knows, it's very easy to overlook some of this stuff. On the back of the Denon S510BT... You might notice that it separated its five HDMI inputs into two little sections, and only three out of the five HDMI inputs are actually the 4K HDCP 2.2 inputs. The first, and the thing that they've done, unfortunately, is that they've made that input three, four, and five. Three, four, and five, and the one labeled media player is or input number Blu two. Ray. Or Blu-ray <laughs> is labeled input number two and number one for Blu-ray, and those are not the 4K HDCP 2.2 input. So. Maybe he already checked that, but yeah. Lord knows it would be easy to plug your Roku Ultra into the output labeled media player or the input labeled media player. Honestly, who decided that the <laughs> three, the last three, were going to be the 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 four K ones? That is right, so wrong on so many levels. But that's engineers for you. So I want, and, and so that you guys understand what yeah. we're talking about here. This 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 
uh, this is a more entry level den. I don't know if it's it the is. exact entry level, uh, but I mean, it's, it's got pretty much their entry level as far as surround it, sound receivers go. And it's got, uh, I mean, so much so that it's got like the spring loaded, yeah, spring loaded speaker, speaker clips, and only five of them. The back. This is a five. And, and it, interestingly, this is, it has two subwoofer pre outs. Although of course that's just an internal Y splitter, but it does Y splitter on the inside. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, is, is when we are dealing with a more entry level. Uh, receiver one of the things that you do have to worry about is that they're going to be a lot more limited in their functionality hmm. but it doesn't mean that they don't have it it just means that it's not always readily apparent right. how to make it work so it'll say hey we can do all these things and you're like great it does all these things i plug it in it's not doing the thing it says it does the thing well this could very well be the case yeah. that you know, well, and of a, course, if the, you're doing the thing that I do, which is like leaning over my equipment right. rack and looking at it upside down oh, yeah. and backwards, man, nobody I'm like, would see, blame I'm, you. I'm blindly trying <laughs> to put the HDMI input it's in like, there. Oh, I found an open that's HDMI me. port. There you go. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you got to make sure it's one of those three. So th that's the first thing to check. Now, also, there is a setting on your Vizio that is certainly worth checking because only HDMI input one can handle 4K at 60 hertz at 422 or 444 chroma, which is what is most likely being sent out of your Roku Ultra when it goes into HDR mode. So you have to make sure that your Denon's output is plugged into HDMI input number one on your Vizio. Right. And then you do need to go into the display settings. And under display settings, you want to go to the input section and it is only available for HDMI 1 within the Vizio's menu, but in that input section, you have to turn on HDMI chroma subsampling. I don't know why that's the name, but it has to be activated, and by default, it is not activated, and it has to be in order for HDR yeah. to work, and it will only one work on input 1. One of these things fixes this problem. <laughs> what, some, something we've mentioned will fix this problem. I'm quite sure of it. Yeah. So along which is, these, it, <laughs> which is amazing that this entry level re receiver can really do all these things. Right. It, it, the fact that it makes it a little bit more difficult is is part of the the yeah. why you paid less for Unfortunately, it. Unfortunately, not but, plug uh, and play. But along these lines, I, I'm not going to mention his name because he was a little bit embarrassed by it. But this again, an example of we have all been there, and it's easy to do. I had someone email me, and instead of making this a full question, I'll throw this in here. He just got a new Monoprice Monolith amplifier. Was very excited. And he's like, I have just spent the last three hours of my life <laughs> connecting this to my Denon or Denon Marantz. It was one of the popular brands, AV receivers and nothing. I'm getting no sounds, no test tones, no pink noise. Nothing is coming out of this thing. And I was like, well, before we go down any rabbit holes, on the back of that monolith, there are these little teeny switches beneath the inputs that switch between the XLR and the RCA input. They are so easy to miss. Oh, Lord, <laughs> there are, are they? Especially if you're looking at it upside down and backwards, right? right? Which is they're what I do. Below yeah. the inputs, right? They'd, they'd be visually hidden if you were looking at it upside down. So I'm like, yeah, make sure all of those are clicked over to RCA. And he, he wrote back, he's like, it was the stupid XLR to RCA switches. And more than Don't that, he, ever speak to me of these switches again. They had, are dead to me. He had downloaded the manual, but the manual that they have online is for the old model that didn't have XLR inputs. <laughs> so it didn't mention that there was this little switch to even look for. So, oh my God. I mean, please, nobody ever feel embarrassed about any of this stuff because Tom and I have most certainly plugged something into the wrong pug, overlooked a little switch, overlooked that one of these ports does the thing we want, and the other Seven don't. I mean, we've all how many times been there. have I told how many times have I told the story about how my one speaker is wired out of the face for yeah. freaking ever? <laughs> And not only did I not <laughs> catch it, but I've had other AV professionals in here going, "Sound, you know, the imaging's not exactly right. I think we should play with placement." We play with placement right. for like an hour. Like, I think it's better. <laughs> you just had to switch the black and the red wires. Yes, and it, it wasn't until. You know, it wasn't until Odyssey said, hey, by the way, your stupid speaker's out of phase. Yeah. Uh, I do like checklists. Checklists happens. sometimes get you to check. My favorite thing to do is that is when you have you have a, a picture of the <laughs> of the the back of the receiver on your phone and uh -huh. you're counting you're counting the RCA you know connections yep. over so that you can get to the subwoofer so you can plug the subwoofer one in there because you can't see it you can't read it and you can't see the color and you have no idea which one is which so you're counting over upside down and backwards. I yes. remember on my old Kenwood AV receiver that everything had the labels on the back the writing for what that input was was above the plug, right? 
That's how all of them were, except for one thing, which I think was like the component video output or something like that, where the writing was beside it, which meant it was also above some other plugs. Right? Oh, I'm like, God. why would you? <laughs> you know what I mean? It can be pretty easy to get confused. <laughs> Good times. All right. So, Ben. Ben is back after we discuss his plans for his 12 by 16 by 8 uh, dedicated theater room. Boy, those dimensions all sort of work together to create all sorts of fun room interactions. But yeah, let's go only on. Only the 16 and the 8, really. The well, the 12 is okay. still a. It's a two thirds thing going on. <laughs> We convinced him to go with a white projection screen and a more compact SB2000 subs and to consider some different speakers. He made uh, more detailed drawings for himself and realized he doesn't have as much space as he expected, which is why you didn't go with the PB2000 mm -hmm, that we were talking mm -hmm, about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now he's thinking he would prefer to mount his projection screen directly on this front wall rather than making any sort of false wall. So that means rethinking his front speaker plans. He could, of course, use regular speakers to the right and left of the screen rather than having them behind an acoustically transparent screen. And he could have a horizontal center either above or below the screen below uh he but he really likes the idea of having at least the center behind the screen so they can be vertically a uh, vertical in the same height as the left right and speakers in his case he isn't concerned at all about sound leaking into adjacent rooms so cutting a hole in his front wall and using an in in wall center or even all three front speakers being in walls isn't a problem as far as soundproofing goes but we don't seem to be fans of in walls it's not yeah, I guess it's true. Yeah, you made but, you definitely made a comment last week that could be interpreted as we are not fans of in-wall speakers. And I, given our druthers, we will avoid in-wall speakers. Yes, yes, that is the case. Yes, that is the case. They are a uh, compromise. Yes. In my book, yeah. Uh, so what do we think you should do? Would something like the RBH Visage uh, VM series in-walls that offer swivel tweeters be a good option? Well, Rob hates swivel tweeters, so... I do hate a swivel tweeter unless the woofers and the entire front face of the whole thing also swivel along with it. Uh, the idea the of here. independently moving the tweeter from the rest of the speaker makes no sense to me. I know customers want it, and that's why they do it, but I don't like that at all. It creates all kinds of lobing problems. Um, all right, so uh, the fact that you're able to and willing to cut holes in your wall mm -hmm. is great, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And yes, that means that you can use in-wall speakers all over the place, sure. but... Uh, where are your bays and your walls? Where are mm. your, where's the framing? Because uh, what you need to do is go across the, fr the front wall of your room and say, this is where I want the speakers to be. Mm -hmm. And then see if there is a two by four behind that, in which case that is not where the speaker can be. Okay, unless this is an interior, and even if this is an interior wall or whatever, you don't want to be cutting two by fours out of your Right, you know, uprights out of your wall, so you can put speakers there. So the the problem I have with in wall speakers is twofold. One, placing them is dictated by what's inside the wall, right. which means that you can't always have them where you want them to be. And two, once you get them there, if it ends up being that they need to be aimed or you know towed in or changed or whatever you're stuck you can't do that so you're at the point now where you've already got a hole in your wall and you're kind of hosed on this mm -hmm. um that's me uh if you are dead set on getting in wall speakers more power to you dude knock yourself out i don't really care it, it will help you pick some good ones and the ones you've chosen would be great yeah i mean but what i could say i i could quite easily get on board with only your center is the in wall it's the only speaker that is behind your screen because you don't need to tow a center, right? The center is going to be firing speaking, straight yeah, right, out. Straight forward. So let's say he goes with a RBH VM, Visage VM series in wall center. I would be A-OK -okay with that. And to the left and the right of the screen are Impression Elite series RBH speakers that use the same M series drivers. And those you can now position and tow in because they're regular speakers to the left and right of your screen. That I would give a thumbs up to because I don't really see any problem with that. And if that's what you're going for, I say A, okay. I would also mention as an idea, just to throw it out there. I mean, I believe initially he was thinking about like a two foot deep 
false wall, as is normally the case. He was going for regular speakers that, in his case, were sealed. Uh, you know, looking at the outlaw ones is what he was looking at. And we were saying, you know, maybe the NHT is also a sealed design, but he was looking at like a one and a half to two foot deep false wall. Well, instead of that, you could go with what is essentially a slim sort of wall mountable speaker like, say, Ascend's HTM 200s or even upmarket their Sierra Lunas. You've got a small room. You don't need crazy output levels, right? 12 right. by 16. You, the Luna or the HTM 200s would have well more than enough output. Those are about six inches deep. And then, you know, even if you are going to have the left and the rights behind the screen, you could have, say, a eight inch deep false wall, which now you can have that whole thing nicely filled with insulation, almost a semi baffle wall going on. You've got these speakers that are only about six inches deep within that, you know, eight inch deep framing. And so without taking up very much space at all, you've still done the whole false wall thing with out any holes in your walls or whatever. So those would be my two solutions to you. One of those two at this point. Mm. Yeah. I mean, or okay, so would if, you if, even if, just go a regular center below the screen? Don't worry about any of this. I, I, I could go either way. I mean, mm. again, you have to go and look inside, look what's inside your walls right. before you can make any yeah. of these determinations. Because if you're like, I want the center to be behind this, in the center mm -hmm. of the screen, behind the screen. Okay, well, where's the center of the screen? Yeah. Is there, a, is there, can you even do what you're asking? Yeah, for? are the, are the now, joists set up to accommodate that? Uh, if they, and if they're not, mm. well, then you're, you're, there, this is all a moot point. Right. Don't, you know, Get your stud finder, figure out where things mm -hmm, are, mm -hmm. and then say, hey, there's a, you know, there's a bay, you know, my center speaker will be offset by this much mm. because of the bay. You know, if I, if I use this speaker, if I use this other speaker, it'll be here, you know, wh what should I do? And, you know, then we'll say what we'll, we'll say, but uh, <laughs> it's just so much easier to go with the speaker underneath. And honestly, your brain it has no problems taking that speaker that's underneath that screen and having it. That is the what Tom himself to is using. I, I, I'm using I, a flat panel. My gigantic center, which is practically bigger than my TV. No, that's really not true. But my gigantic center is sitting below my flat panel. So we're, we're both making do. Yeah. Uh, but if it's an aesthetic thing, I completely understand. Mm. But you're you, really, this is not a discussion. This is all hypothetical until you measure what's inside your wall. Mm -hmm. All right, so he says, Gene from Audioholics recently posted a YouTube video about how to place multiple subwoofers. He links to, to some existing articles on Audioholics in both the video and one of the articles he mentions putting two subs, both in the front wall, but a quarter of the room's width from each uh, side wall. In fact, in the article, he lists that placement as very good while listing diagonally opposite corner placements for two subs as only as good. And he also says he had excellent success with the one quarter width placement while running two subs in a stereo configuration. Some of these articles got to be old. But uh -huh. whatever. Uh, with his, and, and one other thing about Gene, his room is a humongous L. <laughs> <And> <laughs> it's not a little L. Bizarre it's speakers massive. that nobody else in the world has. <laughs> yes. So there's a lot of stuff going on with Gene's room that does not apply to your room. Yeah. I have been in Gene's room, and believe me, your room is not Gene's room. Mm -hmm. So he says, with more detailed drawings, Ben figures he could position two subs either using diagonally opposite corners or this one quarter width placement for both subs on the front wall. Do not do that. It, and if he could do the front wall placement, he was thinking he might build a wood enclosure up front that would house his gear and the two subs. With putting the SB2000s within that enclosure with some speaker grill cloth in front to uh, mess up their performance in any way, what are our thoughts overall? Overall, I think that's a bad idea. Yeah, don't so, do that. Uh, do, do the two diagonally opposite corners yeah. that you said are a possibility. Do that. Do the diagonally opposite I guarantee corners. you some of the things that Gene's talking about are specific for his room mm -hmm. and old. Those are the two things because Gene's got eighty thousand dollars speakers that have six subs. Five, I think I believe yeah, they have three forward firing, three back firing, backwards each. firing subs in each of his each. main speakers, and then he has three or four extra subs going around his room uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, so he's got five you, subs total. Yeah, you are not Gene. <laughs> okay? He also has and, five subs total because there was one seat he could never get working. I'm like, well, Gene, if you stopped using stereo subs up front, you wouldn't need the fifth sub. But no, he is set on doing it that way. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, and then his room has also been completely treated by... Uh, Oralex. Oralex, that's right. So all the walls are, you know, they're, 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 there's framing inside mm -hmm. the room and they have all sorts of stuff behind there. I don't even know all the stuff that's behind there. And but his it is riser quite is a stupid the... resonator. 
Right, his <laughs> his riser is a, so his room is one of the deadest rooms I've been in. I mean, it is quite. Except he's making inert. himself problems with that resonating riser on top of everything else. So I I don't I there don't are, I, there I've are I've never liked that riser. <laughs> But, you know, so he's talking about, his, you know, to a certain extent, his personal experience mm -hmm. and, you know, what he's decided to do. But I, we are telling you from the math, from Harmon, from yeah. Dr. Tool, all the stuff says in your room, which is a rectangle and not yep. a humongously overtreated L, put your subs in opposite corners. Don't stick them in an enclosure. Don't ever stick them in an enclosure unless that enclosure is literally a wireframe and that's it. Which is not. What <laughs> I mean, you're with, talking with about. the sealed subs, if they're firing out the front of the thing, that that wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, you'd you'd be okay if you're going for the SB two thousands. That's not the concern. But it, you wouldn't be building it all the way to the corner, so it's all moot. Do the diagonally opposite corners. But we'll have a link at avrant.com in the show notes for this episode to the Harmon multiple subwoofer white paper by Sean Olive and Todd Welty, and in particular, scroll down towards the bottom and pay attention to the real world stuff that they do because if you only pay attention to the theoretical at the top you're going to go oh diagonally opposite corners don't look that great but when you get into the real world measurement they're like oh actually they perform a lot better in diagonally opposite corners even so theoretically diagonally opposite corners are second best to having so the best is four either in the four corners or the midpoints of each of the walls I guess so diagonally opposite corners is third best. Second best would be two subs, midpoints of each wall. You know, midpoints of the two side walls and midpoints of front and back. Then third best is diagonally opposite corners. Theoretically, that's the case. And then in the real world measurements, it was like, oh, the diagonally opposite corners worked even better than the theoretical predicted that they would. Mm. So, and what didn't work was both of them at the front of the room in any configuration. <laughs> that doesn't work real world or non real world if you have three other subs or four other subs or at least two other subs at the back of your room yeah then two at the front two at the back works but no don't put them both at the front yeah nick nick says he put his speaker system together about 10 years ago on a pretty tight budget he wound up with polk monitor series speakers and a bic f12 subwoofer all power powered by a pioneer receiver sounds like a pretty decent first system there mm -hmm. He upgraded to a den receiver last year and added a pair of Polk OWM3 overheads for a 5.1.2 configuration. He thinks his Polk speakers sound better now, less harsh than before. That was like likely due to Odyssey, right? Could be. Uh, could be. Maybe. It could be yeah. just like, th it can be the case when you have inadequate amplifier power, because I'm assuming it was an entry-level Pioneer receiver and not a higher-end one. Yeah, if he was um, on the budget, yeah. But it could have been getting into some soft clipping there before. That can that yeah. can definitely create the harshness if you were playing things loud, but uh, it could be Odyssey. He doesn't tell us the size of his room, so no. it could be... Yeah, there's a lot of things going on there. So now he's considering a speaker upgrade, upgrading to dual subwoofers and going for a full 7.2.4 configuration, but doesn't have the budget to get 11 new speakers and two new subs all at once. His front, front rudders are new speak, four new speakers are the SVS Ultra Series. Mm -hmm. So would it make sense to only upgrade his front three speakers for the time being? That way he could use his existing Polk speakers as surrounds and surround backs. And instead of spending money on new surrounds and backs right now, he'd put his remaining funds towards a hit the subwoofer budget. Does that sound reasonable? Or would we say he needs to upgrade his surrounds at the same time as his front? Uh, it sounds completely reasonable. I would totally do that. I think your plan is right. I, I do think, uh, you know, it, it definitely makes sense to start with your front speakers. You, that is where the bulk of all the content is coming from that you're listening to. Right. You will notice a difference in music and dialogue intelligibility and all that lovely stuff. And then second thing you got to do after those front three is subwoofers. So I am in full yeah. agreement with this, this and order And I of think operation. this gives you a chance to uh, experience seven, uh, seven points. That's true. You know, and, and, and decide whether or not the seven, the two speakers in the back actually make a difference mm. for you. Yeah. Because I think in this case, in many cases, uh, the surround backs are not all that important you know they end up being kind of immaterial for most people uh so it may not be the case for you but you may find hey i was going to upgrade you know to a 7.1.4 or 7.2.4 i've tried seven points whatever you've got and i don't think the seven is all that much of an improvement over five so i'm just going to go with five and save the money could so be there you go yep so the budget won't cover uh, two upgraded subs right away. Does it make sense to upgrade his BIC with just one SVS sub for the time being? 
So we still don't know the size of the room. Or what we don't subs know the size of the room. I mean, we do know that essentially any of SVS's subs it's, it's is going to outperform yeah. the big F12. They're they're going to get you right down to 20 hertz, which the F12, right. which I like the F12 as an entry level too. sub. It's a yeah. nice not very expensive sub. It is not a bad choice in any means. I'm sure you did some research. You didn't land on that accidentally. And that was a darn good entry level. Any of the SVSs will outperform it. They will play louder and lower. So, right. I mean, given that the idea is the plan is to eventually have the dual subs, uh, you know, is it worth starting with one and adding the second one later? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Spe especially since SVS is going to usually, and I, I don't want to... I don't want to say they do this all the time, even though, to my knowledge, they've never <laughs> not done it. If you call them and say, I already ordered one, I want to order the second one, can I get the discounted pricing, which is mm -hmm. like 100 bucks off on this, you know, on buying two, they're going to give it to you. So Certainly it, within it, a year, they will. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I, I really don't see the downside of doing it this way. Yeah. I would not pair my F12 with this thing. Mm. I, I I mean you can. You can give it a, like mean, if you're if you want to try like my 12 step process to setting up dual subs like just for the experiment of of doing that to see how that works. Yeah, sure, knock yourself out because why not? Well, I mean if you if you can place them across the room from each other or mm -hmm. whatever and you're going to be wiring for it anyways and you're like, "Well, I've wired for it. There's a wire sitting there and I have this extra sub that's not doing anything. I can plug it in and I mean, it's not going to necessarily hurt anything, but, you know. Yeah, no, you can have some it, it, good times experimenting, and so far, I think your plan is A-OK. -okay. Yeah. So you're thinking you just get a second pair of Polk OWM3 speakers for Atmos since they're so affordable at $100 a pair. He could potentially upgrade his four Atmos speakers sometime in the future, but this would allow him to have a full 7.2.4 configuration almost right away. Excuse me. So is that a good plan, or should his Atmos speakers be higher in models right away? No, 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 no. No, nah, no, nah, it's good. Good to do this. <laughs> For Atmos, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of these speakers full stop but Whatever, for atmos dude. purposes they're inexpensive they're super easy to mount yeah. uh they're easy to drive and when all they're being used for is your atmos overheads yeah that's that's great and you know what a lot of people like these little poke owm speakers and if you yeah, want to been, sell them like later three people have mentioned them already yeah so. you'll have no problems and you'll uh, yeah. you'll probably get back almost all the money you spent on them so yeah i i got Go for it you know especially for atmos speakers i've got so so few <laughs> qualms about what what you use. You know what I mean? As long as they're not like the worst things ever, yeah. they can pretty much do the job. Yeah, right. That's it, it's it's very. Uh, these are fine. These will be fine. Oh, yeah. All right, Patrick. Patrick says the LG B9 OLED TVs are available now, and they cost a bit less than the C9 series. Mm -hmm. It has been made clear that the B9 series uses a slightly less powerful Alpha 7 Gen 2 processor, while all the other OLED models from LG use the Alpha 9 Gen 2. That's right. It's a bigger number. It's a bigger number. It must be better, just like 4K. <laughs> but the B9 series still appears to offer full bandwidth and HDMI 2.1 inputs along with a variable refresh rate and seemingly all the same features. So what are the differences between the B9 and C9? Any big reason not to save a couple hundred dollars by going with the B9? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, so I mean, there's the obvious cosmetic differences on the outside, okay? It has a different stand. It has a more, there's more plastic on the back than on the C9 and above. All right, so there's the obvious cosmetic differences if none of those things matter to you. It's the same panel, all right? So the OLED panel itself is the same. Uh, you'll notice like uh, Ratings just did their review and their particular B9 unit happened to be a little bit dimmer in peak brightness than their C9 unit, but it's well within what you could get a C9 that is dimmer than a given B9, right? So that's just panel variance. That's not something you can apply to the model specific. So. What are the actual, they're, they're even smaller this year than they were between the B8 and the C8, because in the B8 and the C8, you had differences where the C8 had the smooth gradation feature, which was hidden within the MPEG noise menu, and the B8 didn't have that. That was to smooth out any uh, color contouring and, or, you know, color banding. And then also the B8 could not take 4K60, or what was it, could not take... 1080p 120 with HDR. It could do 1080p 120 without HDR, or it could, of course, do anything with HDR, but not at 120, whereas the C8 could take 120, uh, 1080p at 120 with HDR. Okay, so those were differences back then. This year, 
None of that applies. Both of them have a separate smooth gradation menu. The B9 and the C9 both have that. And both of them can take 1080p at 120 with HDR. In fact, both of them can take 4K at 120 with HDR. They do have full bandwidth HDMI 2.1. So what the heck are the differences? Why would you ever pay even a couple hundred dollars more? It's if you want professional calibration because the B9 cannot use CalMAN's AutoCal while the mm. C9 and above can. So I don't know. And neither We're, one probably uses it, needs it anyway. Well, in fact, uh, professional calibrators recommend not using it because it like ends up resulting in some color banding that doesn't need to be there when you use the auto cal because it does some kind of weird things with some of the color settings. Mm. Uh, more than that, though, if you are going to have a professional calibrator come in, the C9 and above can do LG's brand new... Do it in like the service menu, manually change the HDR tone mapping. And you can't oh. do that in the B9, all right? And actually, if you're looking at uh, Vincent Tio's recent uh, HDTV test run uh, uh, panel shootout that he did over in the UK, where the C9, to everyone's surprise, won as the best TV, because everyone's like, oh, the Sony's gonna win because it won the Value Electronics one. And some people are like, no, the Panasonic's gonna win because Value Electronics didn't test the Panasonic and Panasonic is claiming they have all the best uh, processing technology. Well, here the C9 won. And they're like, how did that happen? And Vincent's like, well, it's the only one that lets us manually tweak it to essential perfection when it comes to right. HDR. And it works, it works. But the B9 doesn't have that. So it's basically the calibration capabilities. Now, if you look at what ratings did, which is like a user level menu calibration, the B9 is like perfect. <laughs> it's like the, the delta errors in the color and the grayscale were like 0.14, you know, mm. it's like essentially perfect. So unless you want a really in-depth professional calibration or you are dead set on buying the CalMAN software and using AutoCal yourself, uh, Performance-wise, there's basically no reason to avoid the B9. There you go. Enjoy your B9. Mm -hmm. All right, Francis on Facebook. We previously talked about Francis's setup with his B and W M1 satellite speakers that he would like to upgrade. Based on our, his previous question, we limited ourselves to physically small speakers. With Rob suggesting the Focal Sib speakers, or possibly the Klipsch Theater Pack, and Francis wanted something that won't compress at high. Uh, since I'm sorry, Francis wanted something that won't compress at higher volumes, and he wants better dialogue intelligibility. And I believe it was a big room. He was sitting far away, right? Is that, I mean, it's not a that, huge room, but it, I mean, we were eyeballing. It looked like he was about 13 feet away. Right, right. Yeah. So I wanted to recommend bookshelf speakers, and now Francis is open to that idea. So what bookshelf speakers would we recommend for him? Well, if you are sitting kind of far away, then uh, you and you want bookshelf speakers. I mean, the RBH, the, especially yep. the Elite. Yeah, the Impression ones, Elite, if you can afford them. If you can afford them would be my probably go-to here. This gives you a lot of output. Let's uh, put it this way. You get these speakers and you say, I can't understand mm. what's being said. It ain't the speakers. It's Hoss. not it's... the speakers. Yep. We can <laughs> so, be very sure of that. Yeah. yeah. So we can we can do away with that. So that, that would be a, a, a go-to. You could print. I mean, I mean, depending. I don't know how big you want to go as far mm -hmm. as bookshelf speakers. And I price. mean, there's the and the price. So there's the SVS, you know, oh, Prime sure. and uh, Ultra and speakers. Yeah. Uh, if you really want, if you really want high output, the HSUs, the HB one mm. V twos or whatever they're called, yeah. those would be an ugly option, but an option nonetheless. <laughs> oh, they could come in that that sort of rosewood wood finish on the HSUs, so they don't have to yeah. be that. I ugly. don't. I think horns look ugly. Mm. I just you put think the they grills do. on. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Yes, those uh, are all good. I, I would throw a send in there as well. Um, I kind of like how if you go with the RBH regular impression series. And then a step up in price from those would be Ascend's SE series, like the CBM 170 and the CMT 340 and the HTM 200. And then a step in price above that is the Elite Impression, uh, uh, Impression Elite series from RBH. And I think the performance and price tracks very nicely across yeah. those. I think the Ascend yeah. SE are a, a nice little step above the regular Impression series and the Impression Elite are a nice little step above the Ascend series. But the yeah. prices are commiserate with that. But yeah, the S, uh, uh, HSU and the SVS would be good options there too and believe me there are a lot of options where we would go yeah we're, we're very okay with, i mean we could go well paradigm kef psb we could go on and on and on right but well, i mean there's a bunch more speakers that ascend offers and oh, sure. that you i mean you get the various grands and everything else oh, that that's they Aperion. have over there yeah. Aperion, Aperion, i'm sorry but yeah 
the reason that we like so tom always recommends rbh i always recommend ascend and it's for the very same reason which is that you get one of those speakers and we can be quite certain having recommended those to you that if something still doesn't sound right it's not the speaker's fault and that's why we feel so comfortable recommending those two in particular right and but there's tons of other ones out there that mm -hmm. would be just just fine uh, we know that value dollar we know from experience that dollars performance is very good yeah with these speakers yeah. and uh, uh, i mean the svs the hsu the uh, ascend the uh, aperion uh, rbhs and a lot of times kef depending mm -hmm. on where you get them from uh are all very good value for performance yeah. so then when you start looking to me you look at the size to see the size works for you. Mm -hmm. You look at the shape to see if the the, the shape works for you. Look at the aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Look at all the other stuff. And if you come to me and say, "I got this one because it's on your list," but I like, I think it's prettier than the other ones. Sure. Hey, knock yourself out, man. Yep. That's Absolutely. great. And that that'd be, that's a perfectly valid reason to choose one of these speakers. So you know, when you start going through these things, take a look at them, take a look at their size and all that. So he wants speaker stands that can physically attach to the speakers in some way so they can't be knocked off. What do we recommend? Well, I mean, unless you bolt the stands to the ground, I mean, they can still be knocked off. That's just because the whole, the whole stand's coming down with it. But uh, yeah, there's there's the cl the side clamping ones that, that Yeah, I mean, as far as stands offers. go, I had trouble finding like really good side clamping stands. Uh, wall yeah. mounts is easy, but stands a little bit less. Um, so, I mean, I always recommend Sanus as a starting point. Yeah. Because excellent quality stands without being crazy expensive. I would recommend to you the Steel series, which are a little bit more expensive, but you want something that's like super not knockoverable. And the Steel series, you can fill the columns with sand or lead shot, or I like kitty litter inside of plastic bags. Don't fill it all the way to the top, fill like the lower half. That keeps everything, the center of gravity, nice down and low, but it really mass loads it, makes it easy. Now, uh, if you go for the Steel Series Sanus, you're looking at about $160 for a pair of those. If you'd like something that's very similar but a little bit less expensive, Monoprice has monolith speaker stands now that go for, depending on the height, because they have everywhere between 22 and 32 inches, uh, between $55 to $70 each. So no matter what, even the tallest ones are less expensive than Sanus's Steel Series. Now these have four columns, all of which can be filled with sand or lead shot or kitty litter. But they don't have bags. clamps at the top. But they don't have clamps at the top. And I want to address that because Blue Tack or Museum yeah. Putty. Right. Right. You go down to Home Depot, you grab some Blue Tack or Museum Putty. Uh, first of all, that actually gives you a little bit of damping between the bottom of the speaker and the top of the speaker stand, which I like. You know, if any vibration from that speaker is now not making its way into the stand and resonating anything. Uh, but also, Blue Tack or Museum Putty, I mean, the, the, a force you have to exert to actually knock the speaker off the stand when you're using Museum Putty, like, good luck. So that that's what I would recommend. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know what he's worried about. If he's worried about cats, maybe he's got great kids. Danes. He's worried yeah. about his kids. Yeah. Again, I've had speakers on stands for my entire life in here, and he, I've never had a kid knock one he over. He says his six and eight year old crash into stuff, and stuff goes flying. So, yeah. but no, museum. I mean, if you, if you really museum putty, actual museum putty, that stuff ain't moving. All right. Uh, let's do one more, Monty. Monty says, thanks for discussing how we think he should lay out the room above his garage that he'll be using as a dedicated movie and video game space. He says, the return air duct on the right wall where we where we said he should put his screen is indeed close to the floor, so there shouldn't be any restriction on potential screen size. All right, and there's a drawing here, mm -hmm. and there's whatever. I kind of remember this. Yep. All right, so this he's is got one his, of the built-in thing. Yeah, he's got a window and some built-in bookcases on one side, and I mean de facto because the entrance you're walking in and the first thing you see is that window he's like considering that sort of the front of the room but we're like there's no reason why you shouldn't use this nice blank wall on what is the right side in the diagram you put your screen or a flat panel there you got your skylights at what is now the back of your room doors on the right window and stuff to the left that's how we said to set it up is this a seven so it, the way that we have this thing set up it, it would be 17 feet four inches deep mm-hmm uh, 19 feet wide. Correct. And then how, however many feet tall. Uh, about nine feet tall uh, on nine the parts tall. of the ceiling that aren't, you know, sloped. 
All right, so he would like to have two couches for seating. He'd be okay with them being as two, uh, having them as two rows, if that would be best. But what would be the optimal seating arrangement? He recalls us saying not to have any seats pushed right up against the walls and not to have any seats smack dab in the middle of the room. But is a third of the way, uh, uh, but is a one third of the way into the room the absolute best place enough so that he should design everything else around having his main seat one third of the way into the room, or could something else work just as well? Well, okay, so it, we're, we're talking 17 feet, right? Mm -hmm. Having two rows of seats in here is definitely possible. It is. The back, the back row is going to be close to that back wall. Yeah, which is but it's fine. probably not your primary row, so that's okay. Yeah. So I have technically two rows of seats in this room, mm. okay? The, the back row of seats mostly houses uh, blankets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that my family uses it, even though we're in Florida and it's always freaking hot and it's always hot here for some reason they always have to have blankets on their feet so that back row is on the back wall it does very I mean, it's a couple inches off the back wall it does very little other than house that mm -hmm. so if that's what your back row seat's gonna do then that's the way that I would do this yeah I mean I could see having your back couch about a foot off of that back wall where the skylights are yeah. And then, then you have your front row about six feet in front of that. And that means you're about 10 feet from that nice blank wall up front. And I yeah. think that works out really nicely. Yeah. I skipped the question. Uh, so that's the way I would do it. it but mm -hmm. it, it depends on how much that back row is really going to be used. But even then, uh, the back row is always going to be sort of the add-on the sure. plus one of the theater so but know, i mean whatever. the whole one third thing i mean that's an easy rule of thumb it doesn't have to be exactly one third you know it could be five sevenths it could be three fifths you know but what we want to avoid is we do want to avoid smack in the middle right and we want to be you know some distance in front or behind of that but i mean if you've got essentially 17 17 and a half feet from front to back with the room oriented the way we say if you're 10 feet from that front wall you're definitely behind the midway point, and you're good. Yeah. So what do we think? Should this room use a flat panel or a projector? If you go back to a model a year or two, the 77-inch OLEDs can now be had for $3,500 to $4,000. Is that too small? Well, again, the, the, here here we run into sort of, uh, you know, cartling the horse sort of thing. You know, if you're worried about having, you know, two rows of seats mm. and... Uh, you know, you, you can decide to, to do it the way that we said, in which case you'd be 10 feet from that front wall. We're probably going to point you towards a projector. Yep. I mean, that's just 10 and feet away. For that gonna... back row, a projector is certainly going to look nicer. Yeah. You know, if you care at all about the back row, you know, if they're sitting essentially 16 feet away from a 77 inch, that's going to look very small for the back row. But if you came to us and said, I want HDR, I want Dolby Vision, I want, you know, uh, high dynamic range, I want, you know, the special, you know, variable refresh rate and everything for gaming because gaming is super important to me, we may be pointing you towards a flat panel, in which mm -hmm. case we now move your front row in front of the midpoint of that the room. You could. And your back row could be, you know, kind of where we're talking about your back, your front row being right now, mm -hmm. in which case you can now have a small, uh, you know, a smaller screen, which would be big, but be smaller than this. So then you might be sitting seven feet, or six feet away. But also, from that. if you're using a flat panel, it doesn't have to be flush mounted to the wall. You can That's go ahead well. and use a TV stand or one of those three in one stands that makes it still look like the TV is nice and floating, but it's actually on a stand. Because say nine feet away from an 85 inch QLED, which I mean, a QLED would be a fantastic choice for gaming. And we know gaming is a priority to him. Right. And you can get like an 85 inch QLED and sit nine feet away from it. The, the seat is still 10 feet from the front wall but now the tv is just a foot in front of the wall because it's on a normal tv stand and that's yeah. not going to look weird at all and that that could work so there's not a reason why you must avoid a flat panel in here just because it's always going to be too small um you know an 85 inch these days is remarkably affordable <laughs> so right. that that could be done but Given everything, if you are going to have the two rows of seats, you certainly have the space. We know that a projection screen can go there without the HVAC duct being any sort of problem. I'm leaning projector myself. Yeah, to me, you tell me. Yeah. I mean, it, you tell me well, what's you, the most important part You could for you. do both. You could have a roll down projection screen for the really big movie experience and have a flat panel behind it. 
All right, you could, in which case you could leave your seats where they are. Mm-hmm. Your roll down screen suddenly doesn't have to be 110, 120 right. inches because it's on, it's flush on that front, that wall. It's now 92 or 90 inches or whatever the sure. standard is. And it's in front, it rolls down and it's only for movies. Yeah. You know, then you got your low latency, your variable refresh rate, everything else for on your QLED, which is close to the front wall. It's 85 inches, mm-hmm. you know, and then this 92 inch screen rolls down in front of it. So you got this big screen experience for movies. Yep. So you could go both. Naturally, that would be more money, but <laughs> there you go. Hey, we're spending it. You just got to make it. So he has a ceiling fan in the middle of this room and he'd like to keep it. Would that be too much of a problem for installing a projector? What sort of price point do we think he'd be looking at for a projector that can compete with a great flat panel? He's never owned an LCD, always opting for CRT, plasma, or OLED. So will any projector actually live up to his standards? So this is like a nine foot ceiling where the fan is. So I think the bottom of that fan is, I mean, Let's be conservative well, we and say know. seven and a half feet. Well, because we got an image of it. You can see the image of it. Do we have an image? Yeah, if you, the small image. There oh, yeah. It's pretty flush. So, and that, you know, that's not so far down. So, I mean, all you have to do is that any yeah. of the projectors we're going to suggest, you have to make sure that the lens of the projector can, of course, be below the fan. Yes. And then, or the lights on the bottom of the fan. Yeah, the really. lights on the bottom of the fan. And then the very top edge of the screen would also need to be at that same level you know, just right. below, because of course you can't, you know, project up past the fan to a screen that's mounted higher and not hit the fan with the light beam. So, yeah. think so of my problem in my theater <laughs> is that my projector is above my fan. Right. So I have to use lens shift to get it below the fan. Right. So to get it below the fan, I had to take off the the lighting unit. The lights that's below it, right. Well, the lights are still there, but mm. the, the housing around it. So okay. there's just raw light bulbs up okay. there right now, which looks terrible, <laughs> but whatever. Uh, and then it projects below that, and I projected it on my wall, and then I moved my screen mm. <laughs> to where it was. Now but you don't is, have a nine-foot ceiling. I don't. I don't even have an eight-foot ceiling. Right. I have a little bit less than that. So it's very, very tight, and I need to get a shorter fan but mm-hmm. it needs to have a light on it because i don't have any lights in here otherwise i need to get a shorter fan but those things to get it shorter than the one i have and how high it is right now they're like specialty fans they're right. super expensive so no, i mean I'm, I'm looking at this room and i'm like even if you because there, there's this sloped part of the ceiling at the front and the back and i'm like if the top edge of the screen is where that slope begins that still looks to be below the lighting part of the fan in his room. Yeah. So I think you're I think you're totally fine and I mean you will have lens shift but we're not talking about like w- way offsetting it to a side or something like that. You should be able to have the projector lens and the top of the actual projection screen right across from each other and that'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, yes, how much Oh, so we should just say what what would satisfy him? I mean, uh, a JVC would satisfy well, you. Well, for sure. Yeah. You know, uh, but I mean, of course, you're for, to get like the NX5 now, which is de facto has become their entry level model. That is a six thousand dollar projector. You can find it for about fifty five hundred. So that's pretty pricey, right? To get one of those JVCs. The Epson fifty fifty UB is a awfully close. Darn good projector for twenty seven hundred dollars. So that's probably where I'm leaning. Is is an Epson fifty fifty? I think it's a much more reasonable price. However, if you were going to go for like an eighty five inch Q ninety, you know that thing's up in the five thousand dollar range, so it might not be out of the question. So he asks, you know, is it going to be up to his standards? Or and and the answer is, at least for me, there are times when I look at a flat panel display that's been properly calibrated and or at least set up, uh, and gone, man, this. This really does look really, really good and mm-hmm. quite a bit more dynamic and, than my projector does. And the blacks are better and, you know, everything else uh, can be the case. The reality is, is once you sit in this room for longer than two seconds or five seconds and <laughs> watch whatever it is, it's going to look great. So and the size if you A-B is a factor. Them, yeah. yeah. If you A-B them side to side, you'd say the, the direct view probably has advantages over your your projector you know regardless but uh you're not doing that and you won't do it and to get the size that you know you might want to get here you can't afford it anyway the raw size is a big impact yeah yeah that's why i think a 50 50 an epson 50 50 could definitely still satisfy you if i had known that there there was this many parts of this i'm sorry done this (laughs) 
He asks, how much more expensive uh, is it to go acoustically transparent versus a standard fixed frame screen? Considering how much more expensive it used to be, it ain't that bad. But why on God's green earth would you even consider it? This is a dedicated theater mm -hmm. whose point it is to have home theater and games in it. Yep. You are not going to destroy all the stuff on your left wall, which is, I guess, no, is it left wall? Yeah, left wall. All that all that bookshelf garbage over okay. there. You're not going to turn this into like a Star Trek theme thing. <laughs> You're not going to, you know, acoustically wrap everything in, in acoustically transparent fabric so that you can do all kinds of stuff. You're just putting, you know, a home theater in this room. Yes, you could do it. I don't know why you would. I don't think you should. I think you should just go with a regular screen, save all that money, go with regular speakers, save all that money and hassle and uh, be done with it. So. Yeah, I mean, if you stick with Silver Ticket for both, you're talking $250 for a 120-inch white screen and $400 for an acoustically transparent white screen. Uh, so so not, not double. That, so that's, that would be that's that. that. Now, bad. of course, if you're going for motorized and you want the least expensive, I'd probably point you to Elite. Uh, right. Because when it comes to motorized and acoustically transparent, that would be that. And you're looking in the, about, let's call it about $700 range. And then if you're going for what I do think is the best acoustically transparent material, which is Seymour AV, you're looking at about $1,000. Uh, so... Somewhere between two hundred and fifty and a thousand dollars is where your screen will land. Uh, but no, I'm in agreement with Tom. I mean, with with the way the room is laid out, there's no reason why this projection screen, unless you are going to do the projection screen in front of a flat panel idea, if you're going to do that, then I'll probably point you to Elite, and you're probably looking at about seven hundred bucks, and you probably will want it to be acoustically transparent, just so you aren't. Well, you wouldn't even really need to. Though, you right? wouldn't need it no, to you'd be have acoustically the, you'd transparent. You'd have the center speaker below the flat panel. Yeah, it wouldn't need to be. So not, now you're down to like five hundred bucks. So. Yeah, somewhere in that range. So we asked, instead of a full front, uh, full false wall, which no one in this conversation so far has suggested, <laughs> should he consider a motorized drop-down screen? We have suggested that just seconds ago. Sure. He doesn't necessarily want his room to have the look of an actual theater, so then why are you considering a false wall? And could a drop-down screen in front of the window and shelves work well? Yes. Yeah, Again, totally. why? But sure. I mean, are you going to be okay with putting panels on that? The window and shelves because we're going to ask you to put sh you know, panels back there <laughs> you know behind the speakers at the very least well i mean so, I, I know coming up he's asking about his surround speakers that's one of the reasons he's thinking maybe the screen goes in front i mean you'd for sure want to block black out that window like 100 percent black it out because you don't want any light coming through yeah. the projection screen it could be done it could be done yeah yeah so I uh, already said that one. <laughs> uh, what should he figure on price-wise for the cost of it? We just said this. Uh, where should it be? We said that too. Okay, so we already talked about price and where to look yeah, for Yeah, so, so silver ticket if it's just going to be a standard screen mount on the wall. Elite if you're talking about motorized and, well, if you're talking motorized, yeah. go elite basically is the answer. And if you're going acoustically transparent and you want it to be super, super the good. The very best, Seymour. Seymour. Yeah. Uh, where should he put his surround speakers? We suggested having the window on the left so he'd have shelves on the left and doors on the right. If he faces the window instead, he'd have walls on the left and right where he could mount surround speakers. He's leaning for 5.2.4, but still considering 7.2.4. Stands? <laughs> Stands, or if you stick with your original 5.2.4, there's no reason it can't go on the back wall just wide apart. Yeah, nice and wide apart. Nice and yeah. wide apart, because you've got a nice wide room, and they can go on that back wall. You could use something like prime elevation the, speakers with a bit of an angle to them if you want to, or something like or that. Or the Boston Acoustics ones that we've been talking mm -hmm. about. You can use those as well. So, or just regular I, wall mounts with somewhat of a pivot. It could yeah. you know, absolutely work. So um, I don't love the idea of 7.2.4. Uh, if you're doing the two rows, seven. yeah, if you're with doing two the two rows and only having a foot between the back row and the back wall, sticking with the five makes a lot of sense and just have them on the back wall nice and wide apart. Yeah. And yeah, because I've got my back seats are directly below my surround back speakers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they get nothing from there. So any suggestions for an inexpensive 55 inch TV for the bedroom? We're off topic here. Different. Monty different was place. thinking a TCL six series. Unless we say something else is better uh, for about the same price or less. TCL is generally pretty much the best price right now. Yeah, I mean, that uh, 6 Series, Vizio five, would be the... yeah, 500 bucks for that 55-inch with full array local dimming and Dolby Vision and all the bells and whistles. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Vizio is going to be the only alternative. And at that price point, I guess you could look at the new M Series Quantum. Yeah. 
but it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. So, yeah, uh, yeah that TCL six series. Do you, at 55 do you like inches Roku or you like Chrome? Yeah, because those are your those that, are really the honestly the, that is the way to decide. Yeah. yeah. So Monty has the Ascend CR2 speakers and likes them very much. But if you wanted to even better speakers, what sort of uh, price point range would he be looking at? What would be some examples, and uh, would there what would be their benefits over the Sierra two? He he doesn't have the Rall. It does he have says. the Rall. He does the have Sierra the Rall ones. Oh wow, geez, okay. Uh, this I mean this is when you so once you have speakers at sort of the level of the Sierra two, I'm like almost everything else is more likely to be your limiting factor at that point. Yeah. Uh, to get to the point where everything else, including your room, is at the point where you could possibly discern an actual improvement in the speakers, you're much more likely to find a different sounding speaker that you might like on a personal level even more, as opposed to objectively better in some way. It's pretty hard. You could get louder. You can get <laughs> you louder. Know, you can get, get lower. Uh, more even dispersion in every direction because the CR2s yeah. have very wide horizontal dispersion but narrow vertical dispersion. So, I mean, something I could point you to would be like JBL synthesis, um, you know, the things that are based on their M2 professional monitors. Right. Which Maybe are $10,000 a piece. The status line at RBH. Status acoustics from RBH, which now you're into, what, $30,000 a pair and up. Um, I mean that's that's a little ridiculous. I mean the top of the, the top of the regular RBH line too should compete pretty well. Right, maybe some of the top of the line legacy audio stuff potentially. Yep. Uh, again, you're looking sort of in the twelve to seventeen thousand dollar price range, starting there. So I mean, you ask you know kind of what are you what are you getting? Uh, what what are you benefiting over the CR twos? All of those can play louder. Um, they do all have you know like. Well, the legacies don't have taller vertical dispersion. <laughs> They're both the same. They're using that folded right, ribbon. Right. Uh, the so I mean the JBL. One reason why I like that ten thousand dollar JBL M two is because you know it's exceedingly even dispersion in every direction. Ruler flat can play exceedingly loud. I mean it's all the things that you mm -hmm. could possibly look for. Um, yeah, so that'd be about it. But you could certainly do different. You could do something that sounds different from the Sierra twos. Right. So he asked, how did the Martin Logan Motion Series bookshelf speakers compare to the Sierra? They're not as good. <laughs> oh, okay. The motion ones are which one? The, the They're regular the folded tweeter? ribbon tweeter one. They're the folded yeah, ribbon Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you were going to go the higher end, line, the higher end, you know, the, the full panels of Martin Logan, then you would be looking at a speaker that, I mean, just had completely different yes. characteristics. Yes. You know, they th dead on just for you as you were listening to them, they may be objectively better you know you know imaging wise than mm. the sierra twos but in for the guy seat. sit the guy sitting next to you is not going to feel the same way you do right. <laughs> so uh yeah i don't think the motion series would compare and he asked what are the pros and cons of electrostatic speakers and we just kind of started talking about that the, yeah. the, the pros and cons are the dispersion the left right dispersion the the imaging is insane uh, I mean, they're on. basically headphones without headphones. That's what you're dealing with. The, well, it, there's it, one but, extremely small sweet spot if they're set up but correctly. If they're set up correctly and they're, you know, good electrostatic speakers and you are sitting in the right spot, they are not just headphones. They are like get out of my head headphones. Yeah. They are insanely good. Uh, you haven't had headphones that, as good as these. Right. Of course, you just spent 20 grand on them and you have to sit in a specific <laughs> spot in a specific seat across the room from people. But it's that's the way it is. I mean, uh, I would pretty much never pick electrostatic speakers for any environment where I want an audience of listeners. If the audience is one person that is where I might consider electrostatic speakers. I mean, that's sort of the pro and the con right there because they can do things imaging-wise that pretty much, well, I can't say no other speaker, but pretty close to no other speaker. I've never do. heard a speaker that was better than an electrostatic right. speaker. But the honestly, reason is because they, I mean, while the speaker is some 10 feet away from you and out to the sides, the difference in sound between what is reaching your left ear versus your right ear is so significantly different that that's what creates that ridiculous holographic imaging but of course right. it only works if you are precisely aligned with your left and, and right ear so yeah and like i said i mean i have sat there and gone you know lean to the left 
like this. Mm -hmm. And then I lean to the right like that. And the imaging changed significantly. Yep. So we're not talking like, oh, it's good for one seat. And I can, I, me and my wife can sit in the same seat. No, you cannot. Not unless you're sit, she's sitting on your lap and your head's her. Like, so I guess we, you know, line. when some people talk about the difference between music speakers and movie speakers, uh, I mean, it's a little bit, if you're talking about a one person listening to two channel only, then electrostatic speakers can offer you some stuff that pretty much no other speaker can, but I would pretty much never put it in a home theater where I want more than one listener. I know. Martin Logan has been trying to bust in the home theater market for a long time because there's so much more money there than there is in the two-channel stuff. Oh, and, and hey, going with the folded ribbon tweeters is a good way to do it. At least they have and a wide horizontal dispersion. It is, you know, and that's why they did that. Mm -hmm. You know, once once these folded ribbon tweeters became a little bit more accessible, then you started seeing them do that. But before that, they had the panels on the walls that could come out and you could whatever. Oh, yes. and they're just motorized. And it was terrible. They would, just didn't work. I mean, I, I sat in there in a room full of like 30 people. You know, we were sitting way far away, mm -hmm. you know, so, so that, you know, when these things, you know, they had as much chance to disperse as possible. <laughs> and I just... But they I don't just, disperse. <laughs> I just stood up and I walked from one side of the room to the other. I was like... <laughs> Clint, are you hearing this? And he's like, yep. He's just following me back and forth as we're walking back and forth. That is the nature the of a true dipole that is yeah. putting out every bit as much sound out the back parallel yeah. to the sound coming out the front. And there's a true null. So there is no dispersion to the sides. Yeah. All right. So that's going to be it. Who's left? Andrew L. And that's it. Andrew will All answer right. you next week. All right, uh, let's go ahead and thank the listeners of the week. Uh, we want to thank uh, our 85 patrons over at patreon.com. Mm -hmm. We also want to thank Tom for talking us up to elite home theater seating and accessories for less. Yes, and that's it. That's right, thank Tom. You, Tom. Thank, thank you, you for talking us up. Thank you to our 85 patrons over at patreon.com slash podcast if you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation and drop by avrant.com and click on support avrant if you'd like to give a one-time donation via PayPal. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. If you want your question to be answered on this podcast, email us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.